Hey everybody, we are at a critical time in our country and Turning Point USA, we are at the front lines of what's happening in the American culture war. We are on pace to have 1,000 high school chapters by the end of this year. We have events with thousands and thousands of students, including right now in the very room that this event, the Student Action Summit is happening. We had our Young Women's Leadership Summit with 2,500 young conservative women leaders from across the country. We have a school board watch list project coming out in August. We have our professor watch list project. We have our China on Campus project. We are doing the most ambitious campus tour in the entire country. I personally go and visit these college campuses, but we need your help. And every single gift you give right now is matched dollar for dollar. That's right, dollar for dollar. All you have to do is go to tpusa.com. That's tpusa.com. Hit the Donate tab. It's hard to miss. And give what you can. Every dollar is matched dollar for dollar. And we here at Turning Point USA, we have 165 full-time people on our staff in the field that are doing the work of organizing groups, of getting students trained and activated to be able to take back our country. If you're worried about our educational system, if you're worried about the future of America, then please back us up if you can. Give us the tools and the resources we need to keep growing. We are going to be hiring another 28 people just in August in just one project in particular and 30 other people just to work on college campus type work. And you guys can help us at TP. USA.com. That's TPUSA.com. God bless you guys. Thank you so much for backing us. Remember, your gift is matched dollar for dollar at TPUSA.com. Endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness.
Please welcome to the stage, Congresswoman Kat Cannon. over here there you go okay all right let's try this can I get a woo all right what about over here come on y'all we've got Ron DeSantis today you got to get better than this that's what I'm talking about we've got Kaylee today we got Don Jr. today that's what I'm talking about. Okay, so you guys have to excuse me. Charlie backstage just told me that I am not allowed to cuss. Now those of you, now those of you who know me, you know that this is part of me. That's my brand. So to substitute, I'm gonna use some, some backwoods lingo. So bear with me, y'all are gonna get the real deep south North Central Florida cat today. Now you're probably wondering why am I walking around carrying my phone? It's because I just got back from the border about 24 hours ago. Yeah. <laughs> 24 hours ago, I was standing on the banks of the Rio Grande River and I had the Texas Rangers with me. I had the National Guard, yeah. And I had Border Patrol with me. They deserve a round of applause. And I gotta tell you, they felt so demoralized. We were watching coyotes bring little kids across and these coyotes are talking crap to us. See, I cleaned it up, Charlie. And they're talking smack back and forth. And I was talking to the, to the National Guard, to the police, to the Border Patrol, and they're like, we feel like nobody cares. We feel like nobody hears us. We feel like our hands are tied. And so I walked out here with my phone because I'm in touch with a lot of these people and I wanted to send a good heartfelt message that there are people here who do give a darn, clean it up, and so if you would indulge me for our first responders, for our law enforcement, for our border patrol, for our Texas Rangers, for our National Guard, show them some love. Come on. Come on. USA, USA, USA. Woo! We love you guys. Woo! All right, now I'm going to put it back in my pocket. <laughs> so you guys, some of you know me, some of you don't. My name's Kat. I am the youngest Republican congresswoman today. And my story is a little unique. I was not planning on going into politics. I was never primed to do this. I was never asked to do this. In fact, people tried to talk me out of it. But I wanna share my story with you guys because quite frankly, whether it's here in the great state of Florida, in your hometown, in your state legislature, your school board, or heck, even in Congress, we need you, I need you. Because quite frankly, being a millennial in Congress, it's a little bit lonely. It is, I mean, honestly. I can ask you guys and be honest with you guys because we get each other, right? I've got a battery pack on me and if I tend, I say, well, does this battery pack make my butt look big? You'll tell me. You'll tell me if I have a booger in my nose, right? So I figure we're gonna be honest with each other. We're gonna, we're gonna have a decent, candid discussion. So when I decided to run, like I said, people tried to talk me out of it. 
because I wasn't tailor-made for Congress. I wasn't what they were looking for. See, 10 years ago, I was homeless. My family, we lost our small cattle ranch because of an Obama-era housing program. That's right. Mr. Man of the People ended up taking seven million American homes during his tenure as president. And at that point, after four and a half months of being homeless, I got pretty mad. See, Charlie, I cleaned it up. I got angry, and I decided to do something. So I got involved. And I decided I was going to move across the country, work for a guy who felt as much passion to taking on big government that I did. And we won. For the last eight years, I had been serving as a deputy chief for this member of Congress. That's when I met my husband. Now, I got to tell you guys, I got a super sexy firefighter husband. Yeah. I can say sexy. <laughs> and, you know, we, we just made a life. And that's when I really became impassioned about first responders and law enforcement and all the things that they go through for us. And when it came time to make the decision, are we going to run? My husband's like, baby, you really want to do this? And I said, you know, only in America can someone like me, the daughter of a single mom who just was homeless, go for Congress. And as we're getting ready to have babies, no babies yet, but as we're getting ready to have babies, I was like, you know, I'll be damned if I'm going to raise babies in a socialist nation. I'm not doing it. And I want to preserve, I want to preserve that same opportunity that I had that allowed me to go from homeless to the House of Representatives. And so we did it. We jumped in. We were all in. And as you guys can tell, I'm not a normal politician, I'm just not. And so we weren't going to have a normal campaign, and we didn't. We didn't have normal campaign ads. In fact, we have chickens with ties running around in our ad. And the whole point was, listen, politicians in Washington, they're a bunch of chickens. They'll run away from President Trump. They'll run away from the Second Amendment. They'll run away from all the things that we care about. And to me, that was chicken you know what. And I, because I, like, like Charlie said, I couldn't say that word out here. I couldn't say that on TV. And so instead, the, ch the commercial said, you know, and that's chicken. I do that really good, right? <laughs> and when you think about it, it is chicken you know what. You know, I cannot believe, and I'm sure you guys are like me, we are at a point in our nation's history where we can't even agree, as Americans, on the issue of life. What is life? See, my mom, when she was pregnant with my sister at 27, she had a stroke two days before she was supposed to give birth. She spent the next year of her life learning how to walk again, talk, just basic motor skills. And the doctors told her then that she would never be able to have kids again, because it would certainly kill the baby, and her. So years later, when she got pregnant with me, the doctor said, oh no, you need to abort this child. You're going to die. So she hid her pregnancy. She hid me for as long as she possibly could until her mom, my grandmother, found out. And she had one thing to say. So you want to die? And you can imagine a young single mom scared to death being told by her doctors, by her family, that she's going to die if she doesn't abort this child. Now, one thing you, you'll learn about my mom is she's a total badass. I'm sorry, Charlie, I had, to, I had to put that out there. She is, she is. All moms are. And up against all odds, she said, no, I'm choosing life. I'm gonna keep this baby. And so today, as I go through the halls of Congress and I talk to my colleagues about the issue of life, why it's so important that we uphold and defend and protect those most vulnerable, because not just my personal story, but for the fact that this government is the biggest bunch of hypocrites that I've ever seen, right? 
You can't have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness if you can't protect the very first tenant, right? And I said, what are you guys doing? They said, oh, well, this is, this is, a, this is, this is a thing. Like, we gotta, we, we'll get kicked off our committees if we go down this path. I said, well, what about the hypocrisy of government, the double standard, rules for thee but not for me? They said, oh, that doesn't exist. I said, oh, no? Doesn't NASA consider bacteria on Mars life? And they're like, oh, yeah. I said, and doesn't the Department of Justice consider a pregnant woman murdered a double homicide? And they said, oh, yeah. I said, so get your, get your facts straight. But as we all know, don't confuse the left with the facts, right? That's dangerous. Because the facts fly right in the face of their narrative. It's like Kamala with the border, right? She went to New Hampshire. I sent a little tweet. I said, wrong border, ma'am. <laughs> and she's like, it's not a border state. I'm like, oh, geography failed her. <laughs> I'm telling you, they don't like the facts. I'm on the border 24 hours ago. I'm watching cartels, Americans working for the cartels, bring these people across. People on the international terrorist watch list. People who are peddling drugs. Did you know that there have been enough drugs, enough fentanyl peddled across our border just this year to kill every man, woman, and child in the state of Florida nine times over? Nine times over. But we don't have a crisis, right? That's what the White House says. The White House wants us to believe that there is no crisis on the border that all those people that are coming across, streaming across to the tune of almost 300,000, they're fake, they don't exist. Here in Tampa, they have a shelter started. Every single town in America is a border town today because of this administration. And you cannot protect your hometown if you don't protect the homeland, am I right? like I just depressed you guys. I'm supposed to be out here giving you all riled up for today, right? So let me tell you, let me tell you some good stuff. Let me tell you some stuff that's going on that's really good. This new freshman class in Congress, it's pretty dang good. You know, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. We're fresh. We are fierce, fearless. You know, it's funny, my girl Lauren Boebert, anybody know Lauren? So her and I, we swap districts. She's from Florida, I'm from Colorado. We both represent each other's home states in the third district, so we get along great. And it's funny, we were doing an interview together. She said, I tweet, cat cusses, it works out great. <laughs> but that's the thing, we need people who are more concerned about the country than they are their political career. And that is exactly what you have in this new freshman class. People who are willing to stand up, yeah. People who are willing to stand up, who are willing to fight. People who give a darn. Whew, I've never said darn. That was unusual. <laughs> I'm serious. And I tell you the stories about my mom, about being on the border, about my sexy firefighter husband. <laughs> he has a Fu Manchu, y'all. He has a fire engine red Fu Manchu. You can't miss him. He looks like Mr. Bean, but like a sexy Mr. Bean. <laughs> it works. It works. But I tell you all that because I want to tell you this. You guys are doing something that your peers are not. Your experiences today, leading up to you, this point in time in your life, are preparing you to protect and defend the homeland. Because our country needs you. People like me, people like Lauren, people like President Trump, people, patriots all across the country who have stood up and said, enough, we're not gonna take it anymore. We're doing it because our personal experiences have led us to this point. And that's what the country demands in this moment. You are made for a moment such as this. So please, don't ever shy away from who you are. Know that your personal story, good, bad, the ugly, it all matters, it all counts. Because America needs your story right now. More than ever, we need young people, Gen Zs, millennials, at the table where we're not just sitting there listening but our, our elbows are on it. My mom would smack me if she knew my elbows were on the table, but at the table <laughs> and having a voice. And if they don't listen, we turn that damn table over. 
because this is our country. This is our future. And I'm telling you, I've been all around the world. That's like a start of a rap song. <laughs> I've been all around the world. There is no better country than the United States. There is no better country than the United States. This country is worth saving. Our constitution is worth defending and upholding. And we need you guys at the table. So be it today, be it tomorrow, be it five years from now. I want to see you on a ballot. I want to see you engaged. I want to see you engaging with politicians because you don't work for them. We work for you. And it's about time that we actually start acting like it. You guys, we've got a great day planned. Can we give it up one more time for the incredible speakers that are going to be here today? Don Jr., Kaylee, and the best damn governor in the union, Ron DeSantis. Woo! Y'all, you are amazing. Let's have a great day. Enjoy this weekend. God bless, and thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Love you guys. Welcome to the stage, Alex Marlowe. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here, especially all of you who were out late partying yesterday. I could hear you from my hotel room when I was trying to go to sleep. That's dedication. If you're here to learn and here to party, that's my type of people. I like that. Uh, I'm Alex Marlowe. I'm editor-in-chief of Breitbart.com, and thank you. And I'm the author of the new book called Breaking the News, which is now a national bestseller. Thank you very much. Uh, and I will be doing a signing today at noon. So come by and say hi, and we'll say hello, and I'll give you an autographed copy. And uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about the book and a little bit about my favorite thing in the world, which is the news. Um, but most importantly, I want to tell you a little bit about my personal story. Because a lot of you are younger people, you're starting off in the world, you're starting off maybe down a path of fighting for conservative values. And, and I've had the, the blessing and the privilege to be able to do that. Uh, but it wasn't always you know, what I'm doing now, which is sort of living the dream. I get to speak at conferences like this, I get to edit Breitbart, I get to be on national radio. All these things are really fun and enjoyable and high impact, but it wasn't always like that. It was a long journey. It was a journey that started in Los Angeles, where I went to a prep school in the middle of Beverly Hills. So these are a specific type of liberals that were there. It wasn't just liberals, it was elite liberals, elite Hollywood liberals. So. This is where my journey begins, and it ends with me now getting to take on the establishment and the left full time. And this is a story that is so exciting because it took me to UC Berkeley, where I was a student there. Berkeley is the only place in the country where the communists actually admit they're communists. So we got a lot of communists in America right now. Just see all the people who won't stand up for the rights of Cubans to be free right now. There's a lot of, exactly. There's a lot of communists, they just won't tell you they're communists, but in Berkeley, they'll actually tell you. And I somehow went there, and I did well. Uh, and while I was there, I met a man named Andrew Breitbart. Now, how many of you are familiar with Andrew Breitbart? <laughs> Love that. A Andrew's legend is growing, but it has to grow more. He's got a great book called Righteous Indignation. If I make one recommendation, go on YouTube and watch the video where Andrew hijacked Anthony Weiner's resignation press conference. It, it, it's, it's a thing of beauty, some of you know. Uh, but I met Andrew, and he's a new media pioneer. And he built this empire with Breitbart.com, and so he launched so many careers, uh, including some of the people who you're hearing from today, Charlie Kirk, Dr. Gorka, and many, many others went through Breitbart before they went anywhere else. And 
one thing he did is that he understood the viral media and he understood how being a happy warrior was essential. You can't just have the best values and you also had to have the best mindset. And that mindset involved having two modes. The first mode was jocularity. Andy Breitbart could joke with the best of them. He understood the power. He was like the original memester before there were even memes. He understood that mockery, ridicule, having a good time with your political foes was the best way to expand. Uh, was the best way to expand your field of vision and the people you could appeal to. But he also understood righteous indignation, meaning that you don't give an inch to the left. These were incredible values and. I went in and I saw this vision, I saw his vision for a new media company, and I thought, okay, I want to do it, sign me up, I want to be a, what are we doing again? Okay, we're blogging, we're bloggers, I want to be a blogger all of a sudden. And so I was a blogger with Andrew, but was I? Not necessarily. And I want to share this with you guys because even though my title was associate editor at the start, it wasn't just editing, there was, sure, there was some editing, but there was a fair bit of picking up dry cleaning, there was a fair bit of picking up groceries, and there was a fair bit of being a designated driver. Those of you um, who are, uh, grew up uh, before Uber and Lyft, you actually had to have someone, if you're gonna go to a bar, you had to actually have someone be assigned to drive you home. It was amazing, it was a, it was a totally different time. I bet that feels like a thousand years ago to you guys. Uh, but I was the lowest person on the totem pole, and then I found something that I could be really, really good at. And I share this with you because everyone values being well-rounded. I value being well-rounded too. But I realized that I could write a really great headline and I hone that skill. Now, I'm not saying you all have to be great headline writers, but I'm saying if you find a skill where you can really be great that drastically increases your value to your company, it drastically increases your value in your life. This is a crucial lesson because the way we structure academia, the way we structure school, it's all about everyone, you do 45 minutes of math, you do 45 minutes of reading, you do 45 minutes of PE. It doesn't make any sense because in your life, the way you distinguish yourself is you become really terrific at one specific thing. And for me, that thing was, was headlines. I learned the right balance of language and cadence and rhythm and trying to paint a mosaic, often using emojis. I like to use emojis sometimes. Those of you who go to Breitbart know. But sometimes we bring out the clown emojis. We're using from Mark Milley this week. That guy got the clown emoji. It's a, that guy's white rage, man. His white rage knows no bounds. Um, but this is a crucial thing because this helped me move on my way, but it wasn't quite on easy street yet. Because what happened when Breitbart started to get better? The attack started to come in. What were we called? What's the first thing? What are all you guys called if you disagree with the left? What's the first? Racist. That's the first one. Of course we were racist, even though the company is owned by Jews and even the New York, New York Times admitted we have a record of promoting women and minorities. That didn't stop people from calling us racist because that's what the left does. So then what did they try? They called us fake news. Actually, if you look back at the origin of the story fake news, before Donald Trump ever said that fake news is the enemy of the people, okay, okay, before Trump ever said that, Hillary Clinton was calling Breitbart fake news. Why? Because they knew we were real news and she knew that if she could marginalize us as not telling the truth, then it would lessen our impact. So then all of a sudden they started trying to boycott us. We were part of the original movement to cancel people. Uh, and why? Because we were getting stuff wrong? The exact opposite. Because we were getting stuff right. Because we were reporting on stories that the establishment media was missing and we were getting these stories correct. And they weren't just the stories of today. They were the stories of tomorrow. Let me give you a few examples. Back in 2014, Breitbart was the first outlet to report that it was actually the Barack Obama, Joe Biden administration that put the kids in cages at our border. This is a story that is not talked about by the establishment press, but we had footage of not just kids, but illegal immigrants in general being rounded up into these warehouses, chain link fences, mylar blankets, looked like tinfoil. And the establishment media was burying this. We didn't at Breitbart. We reported on it. The next big thing for us was we were, were the first report on Brexit. Um, you guys know Nigel Farage, a great friend of Breitbart. Thank you. And, and Nigel said that Brexit wouldn't have happened without Breitbart.
when so many in the establishment media were catching up on what was one of the biggest stories of the century, Breitbart was there. I was in London that whole summer in the build-up to Brexit, one of the biggest acts of populism rising up against an entitled elite in the history of the world. And we were on the cutting edge of that. It goes on from there. We were blowing the whistle on China and the threat of big tech before anyone else was. And most importantly, and the thing maybe we're most proud of, we saw the rise of Donald Trump before any other major American media outlet. So this is an amazing track record. I'm very proud to brag about it, you guys. So of course this meant the media would call me up and have a nice conversation, see what are you guys seeing that we're not seeing? No, the exact opposite would happen. The cancellations got worse. The boycott efforts got worse. The efforts to block us out got worse. But I got good news for you guys and bad news for the fake news who might be watching. They've all failed. Not only is Breitbart a massive outlet and growing, but we've also launched so many careers and inspired so many others to join us in conservative new media, whether it be outlets, print, podcasts, videos. All of these people started with Andrew Breitbart as an inspiration, as the original pioneer, and we're so proud of that, and that is why this movement is so strong and growing. But here's the big message for all of you, no matter what you're going to be doing in your life, is that we live the only way I believe you can live in this modern cancel culture era. That's living boldly, living loudly, leaving nothing on the field when you go to battle. And even though these risks were massive, this was a righteous path. But it wasn't just a righteous path, it was also an effective path. Look at the state of the conservative movement today. They're almost in lockstep on the values that Breitbart's been talking about for the better part of a decade. Everyone's for a strong border now. Everyone's anti-globalism now, anti-elitism, anti-corporatism, anti-Chinese Communist Party, deeply skeptical of the tech oligarchy, pro-rugged individualism, and best of all, we all believe the fake news is the enemy of the people, okay, okay? These aren't just popular positions. These are very popular positions. So I wrote this book, Breaking the News, and so many people bought a copy that the New York Times was actually forced to put it on their bestseller list, even though it's got an entire chapter on how horrible the New York Times is. How cool is that? But the premise of the book, the original thesis, and it goes much deeper than this, it goes into election integrity issues, it goes into big tech censorship, it goes into a lot of stuff, but the original thesis that I was going out to talk about and, and research, it was a year of research, 1,200 endnotes by the way, that's why you can't call it fake news. Uh, it was to explain how the establishment media went from being a liberal bias, like, the, the, okay, we get it, they're liberal, they like Democrats. It was beyond that. Once Donald Trump came down that escalator, something clicked in their brain. And all of a sudden, they became weaponized. They became weaponized against Donald Trump and his supporters, people like you. So it's not just that they're biased. It's that they are trying to destroy you. This is a lesson that Andrew Breitbart got from Rush Limbaugh and passed it on to me and so many others. They're not trying to negotiate. They are not trying to convince you or win you over. They're not trying to compromise with you. They're not trying to have a civil discussion with you. Some liberals are, and they end up here at events like this, not at liberal events. But the left is trying to destroy you. So Andrew gave us the tactics to fight back. But the first one is you must join this culture war right now. If you're sitting at home, if you're on the fence, we need you. Enlist right now. You have to be a part of it. And let me say for the fake news, I disavow all political violence. I disavow all political violence. You've got to say that stuff because they'll take you out of context. Many of you are doing this, and that's why the Joe Biden agenda is nowhere. It's stalled out. How's HR1 doing? It's nowhere, right? How about the infrastructure plan? Do you guys catch that Chuck Schumer has called the infrastructure bill for a vote next week? No one's read the bill. No one's seen the bill. The bill doesn't exist, and they're already going to try to vote on it next week. It's an act of total desperation. Why is this? Because the right is in lockstep. They don't want to pass the green new BS that they're going to pass off as infrastructure that's going to cripple the economy. The federal judge just overturned DACA last week, DACA amnesty. 
an amazing thing. Something that would have been unfathomable. And now, one of my favorites is that these anti-science mask mandates, how many of you have masks on, by the way? It's a big crowd here. I don't see one. The anti-science mask mandates are becoming a joke, which is a good thing. The people are seeing through the Biden administration's lies. But we do have a lot of work to do. Uh, before I came on today, I was pulling up some numbers on inflation. Some of these are pretty scary. Car rentals are up 87% since Biden took office. Used cars, 45%. Gas prices are up 45%. I filled up for 100 bucks this week. It was $100 to fill up. Airfare is up 24%. Moving's up 17%. And here's the scariest one of all. The price of bacon is at an all-time high. <laughs> now you lost me. This is the Biden inflation. Can you guys say it with me? Biden inflation. And this affects you. This is a regressive tax on working class people, middle class people, and poor people. Who has a longer commute? Working class people have a longer commute than middle class people. White collar people, they can sit at their desk. They can telecommute. They can work from home. The people who are the working class, they're the ones with a longer time in the car. They're the ones who are getting killed at the pump. The establishment press is not going to hold Joe Biden accountable for this. Only you guys can. There's also a surge of illegal aliens at our border, which is very disturbing. But did you catch that the biggest concentration of illegal aliens, which state do they want to go to? You guys notice this? How many of you know? Florida. They want to go to Florida. So this is the biggest concentration. So, we're this racist country, and all these people, presumably most of them are brown people, are still coming to the country, and they want to specifically go to the state that's Donald Trump's adopted home state. And we're supposed to be told we're all racist. It's a horrible place. America's what a horrible place. It's still frightening, though, because they are coming in with these drugs, and they are part of this industry of human trafficking where they're smuggling human beings. And while we don't know every illegal alien that's coming over the border, the cartels know every illegal alien that's coming from the South up through America. It is all an industry, a massive multi-billion dollar industry enabled by the United States government who will not secure our own border. This is why we need to stand up. And if we don't stand up, you might take a look at a place like Los Angeles that's now bringing back the mask mandates, even though they go against science. There's something darkly funny about this to me, because if the masks are coming back, doesn't that prove that Joe Biden failed in his efforts to stop the coronavirus? Like, it, it's kind of a cell phone. It's kind of the left dunking on itself. They do that sometimes. So, and of course, I have to mention for a second time that Joe Biden and our evil media why won't they stand up for the, for, for the Cuban people who are standing up for freedom against communist oppressors? I don't get it. This is a black and white issue. This is as clear cut as it gets, and they won't do it. So I know many of you can't wait to vote in 2022 and 2024. I know that. But we can't wait that long. And if you're here, that's a good thing. But if you're at home, if you're thinking about it, if you're thinking about what your next move is in life, we cannot wait till 2022. We have to get involved now. It starts with just being vocal, simply being vocal, raising your voice at home, in your communities. I recommend reading your Bible. I recommend reading the founding documents, getting wisdom from these things. These things will help you hone your arguments. I want you to support businesses of people who share your values, and I want you to start your own businesses that carry these values, America First conservative values. Judeo-Christian values. You should be volunteering for causes that you believe in, and you should be growing your leadership skills when the opportunities present themselves. This is how you build strong communities and build strong families. And most importantly, and this is my favorite recommendation of them all, never miss an opportunity to own the libs. Please, never, never. So, if Donald Trump and his team are correct, and the best for this nation is yet to come, it is going to take all of you. This is a huge battle, and the left is deeply, deeply engaged on it. It's going to take all of you to fight like Andrew Breitbart. Fighting for freedom with all you have, and enjoying yourself every step of the way. 
Thank you. I'm Alex Marlowe. Check me out at noon today. God bless America. Please welcome to the stage, Dr. Sebastian Gordon. Good morning, Patriots. All right. Alex is going to go backstage to recover from the fireworks. I'm not sure he's used to that. And uh, we're going to have some fun. It is a great honor to be here today, especially to talk to you about why you are here. Because I know why you are here. You are here because of what we have witnessed in this, the greatest nation on God's earth, for the last year and a half. It came to me about six months ago on my daily radio show. I realized we only have one real problem in this nation. I don't care what your pet rock is. I don't care whether, like me, you're a big gun guy, Second Amendment guy. It doesn't matter whether your core issue is the right to life, protecting the most vulnerable in our society, or freedom of speech and the threat that big tech poses to us. It really doesn't matter which issue it is that gets you up in the morning, gets you fired up, and gets you to one of these events. Because whatever the issue is, the one challenge we have as Americans, as patriots, as citizens, and not subjects of this, the greatest nation on God's earth, is courage. Look. Look at the last year and a half. Look at how millions of Americans, your relatives, your friends, people you looked up to, knelt at the altar of big government, genuflected in front of Saint Fauci and his fascist diktats. A man who said, Oh, you don't need masks. Oh, you need masks. Oh, you need two masks. The man who denies the science of a disease. Yes, Mr. Zuckerberg. Yes, Jack Dorsey. You can try. You can try to censor us. But I don't deny science. I look at the data. I've seen that the China virus kills less than 1% of the people it infects. I've listened to real medical professionals like Dr. Mark Macquarie who says, when it comes to children, the future of our nation, the mortality rate from COVID is 0.05%. So every time you keep those kids at home, every time you put a mask on them, you are committing child abuse. <laughs> COVID's real. I had it. I caught it. I had three days of a little bit of a sniffle, thank you very much. Why? Because my doctor is a truth teller. And he put me on hydroxy, what President Trump, <laughs> President Trump said is the game changer. And it was a game changer, because I had the mildest flu I've ever had, and I was back in business.
So courage, courage, courage. And you, every single one of you here today at this beautiful event, this convocation of conservatives that is perhaps the most important organizational event in America, you are the key to making sure it doesn't happen again and that this nation has the requisite courage to once again become that shining city on a hill. So, let me illustrate it. Everybody likes a story. It's Sunday morning, right? It's a little early to be doing big data dumps. So let me tell you a story about a young man, 18 years old, about to start college, thinks that his country is an amazing country, one of the most beautiful countries in Europe with a thousand year history that has just survived by the skin of its teeth five years of war, ravaging war that saw 60 million people killed across the world. And that young man had hoped because the war had ended. The big, big statesman, Churchill, Stalin, Truman, had said, peace, we have peace, and you, little Hungary, you can have democracy. But that man starts college, age 18, and what does he see? He sees the devastation of a nation ravaged by war, replaced by the devastation and the ravages of creeping communism. His beautiful homeland is taken over one by one. The Communist Party intimidates, beats up, or murders anybody who tries to get in their way. The national economy is slowly ground up into a machine controlled by the Soviets in Moscow. And this young man says, this isn't what they promised us. Where's our freedom? Where's our democracy? So what does he do? He decides to resist. Not like those weak-ass snowflake punks of the last four years with their resistance. I mean a real resistance. And he found seven other patriots, Christians in his college who were prepared to do something to push back on the communists, to steal their secret information and smuggle it out to a Western nation like America or the UK who could help them undermine the communists. And he was successful. The bad news is, at the end of that reporting chain of classified information, there sat one of the greatest traitors to Western civilization we have ever seen. A man at the top of MI6 in British intelligence called Kim Philby. Kim Philby ran that small group of patriotic students for about eight months until he could identify every single one of them and he betrayed them one by one to the KGB, to the Kremlin and the secret police in Budapest. So at 2 a.m., that young man had that knock on the door of his parents' home. He was arrested, tortured, and given a life sentence. That man was my father, Paul Gorka. And thank the good Lord, after six years in a literal hellhole of a political prison, two years in solitary, two years down a prison coal mine. He was liberated. His fellow patriots in 1956 captured a Soviet tank, bust down the gates of the prison, and freed all the political prisoners like my father. And with the 17-year-old daughter of a fellow prison mate he met in that prison, he escaped to the West across a minefield, ended up as a real refugee, 
not like the people crossing the border now. I mean a real refugee who would have been murdered if he'd stayed in Hungary. And ended up in England, a free man, where I was born to that woman and that amazing freedom fighter. Now, what has this got to do with you, right? It's 2021, you're American, you're young, and you're here. What, what on earth has this got to do with you? Everything. Everything. In the past, I found it hard to agree with those who said, communism's coming to America. Because for me, communism was gulags was political prisons. Communism were the scars on my father's wrists that I noticed for the first time as a young child when we went to the beach and I asked my dad, hey, what's that, dad? And without skipping a beat, with no emotion, he said, that's where the secret police bound my wrists together with wire behind my back so they could hang me from the ceiling of the torture chamber. That's when my life changed. And for me, when people say, ooh, AOC is a communist, I was thinking, well, you know, it's not exactly like Budapest in 1950. But now I realize it's happening. When my former boss, President Trump, with 91 million followers on Twitter, can be unpersoned, like George Orwell just dropped into the memory hole, you realize. When a decrepit, senile old machine politician who's been in politics for 47 years gets 80 million votes? Yeah, right. And when people are losing their jobs, people are being intimidated. Why? Because they love America? When a high school kid is abused in public because he's wearing a hat that says, make America great again? It's here. So let me, let me leave you with this and maybe we'll take a couple of questions. My father's fight may have seen quixotic because he failed, right? He had to escape, he had to leave. But it wasn't through his individual patriotism and actions, he showed those around him what is possible. Not only that, I wouldn't be where I am today. I wouldn't be in America, an American citizen, working in the White House, now with a national radio show, fighting today's communists if it wasn't for his bravery. So I want you to understand one thing. I have massive respect for all of you. I have huge undying respect for Charlie Kirk who built Turning Point USA. Everyone watching, anybody who sees this clip, along with my radio colleague Dennis Prager's PragerU, these, these are the two most important organizations fighting for our freedom today. It's not the GOP, it's definitely not the RNC, it's Turning Point USA, and it's PragerU. But I need you to understand that the future of this country isn't about organizations, isn't about amazing events like this. The future of America is about you, 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 and every single one of you watching. My father, at the age of 18, took a stand, took a stand for truth, for freedom and liberty. And yes, he paid the price, a horrible, horrible price. But by his actions, he sent ripples through the world, ripples that led to me ending up as an immigrant working for the most powerful and one of the greatest presidents we've ever had. So
So my message for you today is keep doing what you do, spread that light of truth so we will once again be that shining city on a hill and never, ever stop fighting. Okay, I never do that, I never finish early. So let's take a couple of questions. We've got a mic down here. Lady right here. You've got you to go to the mic. Right, who's first? All right, I think we're going to get about three questions in. Okay, guys. <laughs> I just want to say I really appreciate your message. The first time I saw you, you were with John Lovell with Warrior Poet Society. Awesome. Riley Warrior, Warrior Poet Society, amazing, amazing. Yep. Check them out. Uh, one of the quotes that he has is, courage has died and we do not mourn her. Uh, how do we in practical ways, not just in the college campuses and high school campuses, but also beyond that, into our adulthood and careers and wherever we are, how do we take that energy, that fire, and put it out into the world even to show that, hey, we don't want courage to die. We yeah. want to bring courage back. All right, let, let me very quickly answer that with a story. About three months ago, my wife and I were invited to speak at a GOP event, not a GOP, a, a conservative event in Virginia at, at the Trump Golf Course. It was a wonderful group, like 300 amazing patriots. And as soon as I entered to the ballroom, this lovely lady comes up to me in a ball gown and says, hey, Dr. G, can I get a selfie? I say, sure. We take the photograph and then I say, don't forget to tag me when you post it. And then her face changes. And she says, oh, oh, I can't post it. I mean, it's so divided in America right now. And, and my husband is self-employed and he's got a company and I'll get in trouble. Something died inside of me when she said that. And I didn't use her name, but an hour later when I addressed the crowd, I told the story of what had happened to me. And I said the following, I said, Lord preserve us. If you call yourself a patriot and a conservative and a lover of America and you're not prepared to put your name to your values on a Facebook post, you're not a conservative, you're not a patriot. So number one, never ever censor yourself and cleave to the truth forever. Next. So as someone born and raised in, or not born and raised, uh, your family is from Hungary, what do you think of uh, President Viktor Orban and his efforts to stand up against the EU? Uh, what I think of Viktor Orban in Hungary, uh, that would be about a three hour answer. I worked for his party back in the 1990s as their national security advisor. It's a complicated story. I'll say it like this. What he and his party have done for, for Hungary in terms of standing up for their Christian heritage and pushing back on the communists in Brussels is amazing. However, the party has some internal issues. Let me leave it at that. God bless you. Thank you, guys. Life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. No country in the world has been created with stronger or clearer founding principles. And we've had to fight for the benefits of freedom to be shared by everyone. These are the principles that have allowed us to create wealth and opportunity for hundreds of millions of people and become a shining example for the whole world to follow. Right now, our grand American experiment is under attack. The principles that built America. Hey everybody, we are at a critical time in our country and Turning Point USA, we are at the front lines of what's happening in the American culture war. We are on pace to have 1,000 high school chapters by the end of this year. We have events with thousands and thousands of students, including right now, 
in the very room that this event, the Student Action Summit, is happening. We had our Young Women's Leadership Summit with 2,500 young conservative women leaders from across the country. We have a school board watch list project coming out in August. We have our professor watch list project. We have our China on Campus project. We are doing the most ambitious campus tour in the entire country. I personally go and visit these college campuses, but we need your help. And every single gift you give right now is matched dollar for dollar. That's right, dollar for dollar. All you have to do is go to tpusa.com. That's tpusa.com. Hit the Donate tab. It's hard to miss. And give what you can. Every dollar is matched dollar for dollar. And we here at Turning Point USA, we have 165 full-time people on our staff in the field that are doing the work of organizing groups, of getting students trained and activated to be able to take back our country. If you're worried about our educational system, if you're worried about the future of America, then please back us up if you can. Give us the tools and the resources we need to keep growing. We are going to be hiring another 28 people just in August in just one project in particular and 30 other people just to work on college campus type work. And you guys can help us at TP. USA.com. That's TPUSA.com. God bless you guys. Thank you so much for backing us. Remember, your gift is matched dollar for dollar at TPUSA.com. Drugs until your brain melts. That's what you get for being anti communist in communist countries, as opposed to being anti capitalist in capitalist countries. Another thing, I mean, any idiot can take an American flag in the U.S. and burn it. And I say idiot on purpose. Try burning a Soviet flag in Soviet Union or a Chinese flag in China and see what that gets you. My point is um, that socialists of all sizes and, and styles, they don't like United States. And the reason why they don't like United States is because it's all about life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, which they hate. And the reason why they hate that, because as a person, as an individual, you hold no value to the collective. They, they don't care about your ideas. They don't care about what you, what you want to do. They care what they want to do. So my point is, if you're a young person and you're rooting for socialism, go read something or talk to people who lived in socialism. No sane person who's lived in socialism wants to actually live in socialism. So that's point number one. Point number two, talking about American flags, uh, when I was six and still living in the Soviet Union, I managed to get myself in a little bit of trouble. Long story short, we lived in a white block of white brick block apartment complex, and next to us lived the Russian officers in the red brick apartment complex. So what we did one day, somehow we realized since we live in a white brick house, we are the White House, and they're the Kremlin, because they're red and Russian. So we made these little tags with American flags on it, and went taunting our, I guess, Russian friends. And uh, because we said, you know, we're Americans, we come from the White House. And what happened is obviously our parents gathered us very quickly and told us not to ever do that again. So that's once again, that's socialism. You get in trouble, or you could potentially get in trouble for what a five or six year old does. That's all about, uh, that's how little freedom uh, is in, uh, in, under socialism. The reason why I'm saying that, because this is as, powerful today and or as important today as ever. Life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, the reason why socialists hate them is because they are ideas and the battle of, of ideas is still raging. It's not the power, it's not the money that control the world, it's actually the ideas. And right now in this country and throughout the world we have some very dangerous and bad ideas that sort of resurged. Now we all thought that in the 90s and Soviet Union collapsed, that socialism has died. Unfortunately, it has not. Just like a virus, a disease, it basically crawled back into where it came from and it mutated. And after 30 years of indoctrinating the young, after 30 years of indoctrinating the academia, socialism is back in force. And it's up to us, it's up to you uh, to fight it. How do we do that? Well, we at Foundation for Economic Education believe that any policy victory without winning the battle of ideas is going to be short-lived. So what we do, we go to classrooms, we go online, and we talk to young people. Young people like you, 16 to 22, we think that given a fair hearing, capitalism will win any time. We go to classrooms, we go online, and you know what's the most interesting feedback we get from students? 
Uh, last year we visited 20,000 of them in their classrooms. They say, why have I never been told about this before? Which just basically shows that young people, most of them are not really socialist, but the fact is they're being disinformed, misinformed by accident or by purpose. And whenever we tell them how capitalism really works, uh, they actually change their mind. I hope we can do this. I hope you can do this. This is the battle of ideas, and it's much more important uh, compared to what, whoever, whatever infrastructure bill is passed or who wins the elections. If we lose a battle of ideas, if US drops the ball and turns socialist, imagine what's gonna happen to the entire world. What country but the United States can actually carry the torch of liberty? If a US turns socialist, I'm afraid that's pretty much it. The whole world will, will actually turn socialist. So it's up to me, up to you, up to Foundation for Economic Education, up to TPUSA to go out there and talk to people who don't think like us and convince them that actually capitalism, free market, liberty, and America are probably the best things in the world. Thank you. want to trust them and take their word, the people who have lied to the American people for generation, they lie a lot. They lie to Congress. They spy on Congress. They spy on staffers. They dig up dirt on people. You should not trust them. I said, if this was CPAC, the crowd would be dead. But this isn't CPAC, this is Turning Point. And you guys show up. I was like, my gosh, if this was, if this was Economics 101 at like a 10 a.m. class on campus, you guys would be the only ones there because none of the other kids show up, am I right? <laughs> it's, it's amazing to me to see the growth of Turning Point and having involved with this movement, with the conservative movement for so long, but really quick, because it is Sunday morning, and I don't know you, if you guys have heard about this, so I'm, I'm Catholic, I'm Polish Catholic, and thank you. And I guess it's like the Eastern European morning today. So we've got the Hungarian, we've got the Lithuanian, and now we've got the Polak coming out here, right? So our Pope recently said that he doesn't want us praying in Latin anymore. He said, that's a big problem. Well, I'd just like to say something to him. No nomine patris et fili et spiritus sanctus. Amen. And I want to make a point about that because that's tradition, right? And tradition is the most important thing that we have. Tradition is not the worship of ashes, tradition is the preservation of fire. It's the preservation of who we are as a people. And when you look at that kind of idea, isn't that what this fight is all about here in the United States of America? They want to take away our values. They want to take away our traditions. They want to take away what it means to be an American citizen. And I think every person in this room is going to say no. We're not going to let them do that. We're not going to let them take away our flag. We're not going to let them disrespect that at the Olympics. We're not going to let them disrespect our flag, disrespect our people. And we're done with letting them disrespect our country. We're done. We're done with it. We're absolutely done. We're totally done. I couldn't be more done. You know, they say that, you know, you know, oh, hey, Jackie, you got 20 minutes to come out and speak. And they say, well, try, should I drop some receipts? Should I do some, uh, should I do a MyPillow joke? You know, I, but I, I did want to say, though, last night, the best night's sleep in the whole wide world, thanks to Mike Lindell and the great people at MyPillow. <laughs> and it's incredible to me, it's incredible to me that when Mike Lindell says, hey, I want to ask some questions about the election, suddenly everyone in the country turns, or, turns on him and they attack him, they go crazy. And I said, I don't understand, Joe Biden, he goes up to Philadelphia and he gives a speech and he says, come on, man, I'm the most legitimate president 
in history. I'm so legitimate. Look how legitimate I am. I'm like, Joe, why are you doing the whispering thing? You got to stop, man. We have a microphone. That's what they're for, right? You're talking about a guy who, like, have you seen him when he goes to eat his ice cream and he makes like a full mouth and he's like, who does that? Right? Who is he? I, and, I, and I said, well, it's simple. Somebody asked me, they said, they said, why does he do that? And I said, well, you don't have to worry about brain freeze when your brain is already permanently frozen. <laughs> I'm just going through my material to see which one gets me canceled first. <laughs> No, but seriously, when you, when you look at the election stuff, it's, it's amazing to me because I was in Washington, D.C., uh, where I was working for One American News. Do you guys do I know One American News here? Any fans, any viewers? All right. And now I'm writing at, at Human Events. And uh, there, well, I know you guys heard Turning Point Live is going to be coming out soon, so I'm not supposed to say that yet. But uh, there might be a little something coming soon with, with me and Turning Point Live, so you'll see. And... When I was with One American News, though, for all those years in Washington, we were told all, it was all Russiagate, remember? So Russiagate starts at the beginning, actually before Trump even becomes president. That's when this dirty dossier comes out, Jake Tapper's on CNN, and he says, we all have to listen to this thing, it's very important, and BuzzFeed, you know, the paragon of journalistic value, BuzzFeed, tells us, oh, look at this, this dossier, it's very important. And they said, we're going to have to investigate it. And they said, hold on, Republicans, hold on, conservatives. You should welcome the investigation because if you didn't do anything wrong, then you should be glad we're investigating, right? And I said, okay, all right, fine. That's your position. Well, when it comes to the election audits, you should welcome the investigation because we're just trying to prove that you didn't do anything wrong, right? You should welcome it. You should be happy, Joe Biden. You should be glad that we're going in here because let me tell you something. If you don't have election integrity, if you don't have secure elections, then you don't have a say in your government. You don't have a Republican portion, small r, of democracy. You don't, and if you don't have that, you don't have a country. You don't have a country if you don't have secure elections. And so that's what we've found as we go through these things. It's like you can't even actually audit an election because the system is so bad, it's so messed up, there's all these moving parts to it. No paper ballots, hand counts, and voter ID. You know, it's amazing. I was interviewing, um, I was interviewing a guy from, uh, <laughs> I just thought of something he said that would definitely get me canceled, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, so I was interviewing a guy from France, and it was, it was uh, uh, just after, it was like early January, um, or no, excuse me, late January. And so he comes over, he's a, he's a conservative over there, conservative populist. And he was saying, he's like, I don't understand why they're all talking about January 6th. They said this was insurrection. They said this was cool, believe me. In France, we know how to do coups, you know, chop chop. <laughs> this, was not a, this was not a coup. <laughs> this was a protest that got out of hand. But, and, then, and then he goes, how can you have elections without voter ID? How can you have elections with these, and it goes into a machine and you can't find where your vote is, you can't find, it's only separated. Nobody around the world does this like us. Nobody has these programs. They don't do it, they don't have it, they looked into it. In France, all of that stuff has been banned since the 1970s. In France, they're ahead of us on this. So I wish, you know, I never thought I'd say this, but I wish we could catch up to the French when it comes to election integrity, right? It's amazing to me. So yeah, yeah. So we're talking to the French about this. We're getting ideas from there. We're getting interest from there. And then I hear, and I actually broke this story a couple of days ago. And I, heard, I said, the White House is putting together lists. And they are putting together lists of who? They're going after people for when they say the January 6th insurrection, right? Uh, they don't want to just go after the defendants anymore. They don't want to just go after the people who were like walking around in the wrong place at the wrong time and didn't even do anything wrong. They said, well, you know what we have to do? We have to go after the people they followed on social media. We have to go after the influencers. We have to make lists of them because they are the ones that actually caused this. And then Jen Psaki gets up there the very next day and she says, no, hold on, we're going to circle back. We're going to circle back a little bit. 
and we're gonna we're just we're just making a quick list of the extremists putting out misinformation and we're working hand in hand when it comes to this we have a list of 12 people and we're going to go with Facebook and Instagram and everyone else and we're going to make sure that they are shut down and she said this this is absolutely chilling when it comes to freedom of speech because when she says it's a list of 12 people, we know it's not just 12 people, right? It has an effect on everybody else, and that's called the chilling of free speech, which, by the way, the Supreme Court has said is unconstitutional because that's against our First Amendment rights. But I got to thinking, I said, my goodness, who could it be that's on this list of 12 people? Who could it be, who could it be, that was spreading misinformation about the vaccine? And I thought, I'm going to have to go check the receipts. Folks, you knew you weren't going to get through this without a couple receipts. So this is going to work, and it's totally going to play. And I found the receipts. I found the people who were spreading all of this distrust and doubt about the vaccine. So Joe Biden and Kamala Harris don't have to worry about it. Jen Psaki, I've already done the heavy lifting for you. Here we go. Let's just say there's a vaccine that is approved and even distributed before the election. Would you get it? Well, I think that's going to be an issue for all of us. If and when the vaccine comes, it's not likely to go through all the tests that needs to be and the trials that are needed to be done. When we finally do, God willing, get a vaccine, who's going to take the shot? Who's going to take the shot? It was Joe Biden and Kamala Harris all throughout the 2020 election. They were attacking every single thing when it came to that vaccine. So I said, I found them. I've done the work for you because that's the kind of person I am. That's the kind of Catholic my parents raised me to be, <laughs> you know, to help people in their time of need. And that's what I'm doing. But, but in all seriousness, folks, to go back to what I was talking about before, I have done a lot of work and a lot of, shall we say, in-person, right, <laughs> work when it comes to Antifa. And folks, you got to understand, there is a reason that the ruling class in this country, the elites, the overstate, whatever you want to call it, there's a reason they let Antifa run wild in our streets, on our campuses, to go after you, to go after your families, to go after your organizations. It's not about them. It's about the people they work for. It's about the people who are in power that are using Antifa as a domestic terrorist organization to be their shock troops in the, tr in the streets to shut you up, to shut you down, and to make it so events like this could never happen. Well, guess what? I'm sorry to say, and I'm sorry to announce to you, but breaking news, we're all here, and we haven't gone away, and we're not going to go away. And if you think you're going to show up in our nation's capital and tear down statues of Abraham Lincoln, the great emancipator, that we are gonna show up and we're gonna stop you and we're gonna put a stop to it. And when this little, this little punk got in my face and he said, get out of here, you gotta move, there's gonna be trouble for you. I just stood my ground and I said, I'm not going anywhere. I'm gonna stand right here. And you can try to knock me down, you can try to push me off, but I'm not giving you what you want. Because Americans are going to stand for our country, we're gonna stand for our tradition, we're gonna stand for our values. And I don't know, maybe it was, it was uh, I, don't, I don't know if we have any War Room fans out in the crowd, anybody watch, the, yeah, a couple War Room fans. And so something that, uh, on War Room that, they, that uh, Steve likes to say is he goes, he goes, you know, there's something about you, you Polacks, you Slavs, you people from, the East, from Eastern Europe. And I said, Steve, it's simple. If you understand the history of Poland, and if you understand the history of that area, and I didn't realize that, you know, we we're going to have the Lithuanian and the Hungarian speaking as well, so it's so perfect that we're getting this. When you're out there 
and someone comes up to you on one of these campuses and they say, well, you just got to understand communism and true communism has never really been tried. And we, you know, it's such a great policy and it's so great. I said, really, is it working out for the people in Cuba? Because I don't see them hanging up the, the hammer and sickles out in Cuba. No, they're flying the stars and stripes of the Star Spangled Banner, the red, white, and blue, because they understand that that means something different. And if anyone out there for, is listening, you know, Media Matters, you can, you can quote me on this one, Cuba Libre, Cuba Libre, Cuba Libre. Because if you understand the story of what happened to Poland for 200 years, first our country was partitioned by empires outside of us. Then we were invaded by Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union in the exact same time. After that, we were under the communist rule of the Soviet Union all the way up until the 1990s. So when I say to somebody, hey, you think you're, you're into communism, you think you care about communism, have you ever actually talked to someone who lived in one of those countries, who actually lived under the boot of the communist heel? And they just kind of shrivel up and back away. Because I'm here to tell you folks, Talk to people in my family. Talk to my, my wife is here. She was born in the Soviet Union and she made it to America. And you ask her, why did you come to America? She said, this is the land of opportunity. This is the land of freedom. This is the land where human agency and human values and human life is allowed to flourish. And right now, we have people that are trying to shut all of that down. So if I have any message that I want to share to all of you here today, is that we're not going to let them shut it down, but we can't just be people who say no, who say stop, who say don't do it. You can't define yourself by what you're against. You have to define yourself by what you are for, right? By what you're for. And we're for America. We're for our freedoms, we're for our traditions, we're for our values. And when they come up here with whatever ism it is, uh, critical race theory and wokeism and communism, and we say no. We say those are not American. These are our values. These are what we stand for because we are the American people and you are not going to change us. You are the ones who are trying to change this country, not us, not us. We're taking it all back. Folks, we're taking it all back to where it's supposed to be. Are you with me on that, people? And if I was hoping, I was hoping, you know, I, I heard, I did hear that we might get some protesters today. I don't know if they're here yet. It's a little bit early. Antifa doesn't usually wake up this early. But just in case, just in case, maybe we could help wake them up with a little bit, if you could join me in just a little bit of a cheer, it's very short, I'll teach it to you. It's only three letters, it goes like this. U-S-A, 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 U, look at that energy right there. Look at that energy right there, U-S-A. I love it, folks. I love every single one of you here. Thank you so much for showing up to Turning Point. Please follow me, go to humanevents.com. All the breaking news, all the scoops, all the receipts, you're gonna have it out there. And join us in this fight to preserve the fire of American tradition, of American values, of American freedom, and of human freedom. Thank you so much. God bless all of you.
host of Poplitics, the first ever daily show that Turning Point USA ever created. And I target young women with pop culture from a conservative perspective. To support shows like mine, please go to tpusa.com slash donate. Hey everybody. Good morning everybody. You have an amazing day planned. I'm, I've been so excited about this conversation that we have today. Uh, with us is Sorab from the New York Post. We just had an amazing conversation uh, on the Charlie Kirk Show. And Josh Hammer from Newsweek. And we wanted to have this discussion around different religious views all agreeing that we need to save Western civilization. And I want to kind of start this conversation first um, by asking what is Western civilization? So we're going to talk about this from an evangelical Protestant standpoint, from a Jewish standpoint, and then a Catholic standpoint, uh, which I think is going to be really fun and exciting. So Josh, welcome. And uh, walk us through, first of all, what is Western civilization? All right, yeah, no, so thank you, Charlie. Thanks to Turning Point for having me. You know, I'd be remiss if I didn't also thank Charlie for being a Newsweek columnist, so you know, thank you for that. And um, yeah, great to be here. You know, Sorb and I got dinner last night. We were joking about how we can possibly uh, talk about how to save the West in 30 minutes. So let's you know, kind of dive right in and get right to the point here. So, you know, I mean, Leo Strauss famously defines Western civilization as kind of the uh, you know, ever-existing tension between Jerusalem and Athens, between the Bible and between kind of uh, Greco-Roman reason, if you will. Um, I, I think that's a good place to start. Um, you know, I'm a research fellow at the uh, Edmund Burke Foundation, which is Yoram Hazoni's think tank. Uh, it's a home for kind of national conservatism. And we think of the nation state, the nation state is being directly derived from the, the Hebrew Bible, actually, the tribes of Israel themselves kind of being the original, the OG nation state, if you will. Um, so I think just recovering uh, a sense of biblical identity and the importance of the nation state in contrast to globalism, in contrast to all sorts of kind of uh, utopian global ideals is a good place to start. So it starts with the Bible, truth, Jerusalem, Athens, and then obviously Rome as well, which is, you know, more my good friend's territory, of course. There, there's a lot there, and so, so Rob, you have an interesting perspective on this, so can you tell us what, does, what makes the West different? Why is this worth preserving? And dare we say, is the West better than other civilization projects currently or previously? So I would define the West um, not too dissimilar from what Josh shared as the combination of Greek philosophy, Roman law, and Judeo-Christian religion. And um, what's, what's special about that combination is this view that, um, that man and, and woman are at home in the world, that there is, uh, 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 that using reason we can understand the world, and because we are part of a whole that is a legible whole um, that can be discovered using reason, we can also understand what it means to be happy as a human being and, when we, and then the, the, the Christian dimension comes in, the dimension of revelation, and, and that points out that although we have some natural ends that are good for us, we, we flourish in families, we flourish in political communities, um, we, there's a, the health of a body that you, you, know, you can discover and learn about, but that there's also a supernatural good um, that ultimately points us to a transcendent horizon beyond this world. So we're, we're of this world, we, we, we are in this world, but not of it, but nevertheless we love it because it's God's creation. I think that, and, and we can ultimately uh, uh, then help people reach that flourishing using law, which is where the Roman aspect comes in. So that tension between those three, that synthesis between those three is the West, and it's made for uh, a truly glorious, beautiful civilization. So I hear from both of you that it's this balance between reason and revelation. So, so Rob, I want to ask you, do you think that there's been an overemphasis on reason, almost overemphasizing the enlightenment and almost putting away the tradition of what is a transcendent order? Who are we and how are we supposed to live? How are we supposed to strike that balance? Because you're saying that we shouldn't forsake reason. It sounds 
like an argument that Thomas Aquinas would make about how reason being a gift from God, at the same point you say if we govern solely by reason, then all of a sudden we start to have a massive uh, issue on our hands. Can you help us navigate that? Well, I, I would reformulate the question. I would say that the, the Enlightenment modern view is an unfortunate narrowing of reason compared to what um, the, the pre-moderns, the ancients and the medievals thought reason could accomplish. The modern view is generally that reason is only that which can be known with our senses, what we can measure with our scientific instruments, um, and, and that's reason. And everything else becomes revelation or op opinion or superstition. Whereas the, the uh, tradition that stretches from Aristotle to St. Thomas Aquinas says, no, actually, we can also know by reason, we can know of God's existence, we can know that there is an objective human good, that human beings flourish in one way and not in other ways, and we can make these judgments about them. So what we live in is not only the fact that God has been banished, unfortunately, from the modern West, but we've actually gotten a narrow, too narrow account of what reason can do. I think that's really well said. So Josh, uh, so Rob mentioned something and so did you. There is this idea of objective truth. Uh, it's something that we don't like to talk about very much in the last 20 years. In fact, we play into this idea of my truth. I'm sure a lot of you have heard that on your college campus or your high school campus. How many of you have heard that recently? It's my truth. Is there such a thing as my truth? And what happens when we decide to organize society around everyone's independent view of how they think society should be organized? So, I mean, the short answer is that, no, of course not. There's no such thing as, quote, unquote, my truth. Um, so, you know, I would be remiss if, you know, as the Jew on a panel with uh, one evangelical, a Catholic, and a Jew, if I didn't talk about Judaism here a little bit, I think it's important. So today is actually uh, Tisha B'Av uh, on the Jewish calendar, um, which is actually the saddest day on the entire Jewish calendar. It's a fasting day. You won't see me eating today or anything. Both the first and second temples were destroyed on this day. Um, lots of other tragedies happened to the Jewish people on this day. The, uh, the edict of expulsion from the kicking the Jews out of England happened on this day in the year 1290. The Nazis began the uh, rounding up of the Jews from the Warsaw Ghetto to Treblinka in uh, 1942 on this day. So I was actually uh, in the Warsaw Ghetto in Treblinka less than two months ago. I was over there in Poland. Um, and it's kind of a very roundabout way of uh, answering your question, Charlie, um, but it was my first time seeing uh, the ghetto, seeing the death camps for myself. And when you see that level of human depravity, when you see that level of evil, but you also learn the good stories. You learn about the heroes, the people um, on, the, on the outside of the walls of the ghetto who helped the Jews, so the, the heroes in the camps themselves. You see that there's also such good, that human beings are capable of such good. And it was very difficult for me to kind of walk away from that with such a kind of moral relativism of like my truth, your truth, his truth, her truth. There is such thing as good. There is such thing as bad. And from my perspective, it obviously starts in the Bible. Um, and you know, I think the three of us probably have slightly different definitions, I'm sure, of like what the Bible is and what that contains and what to make of that. But uh, that, is, that is where truth begins, obviously, is in the Bible. And, and so, Josh, let me just follow up. You know, so so in, in the Jewish belief, of the Old Testament, it's this belief in the law that was given by God. And so if you were to even say that on a college campus, you will be ridiculed and mocked that the divine would give you a way to live your life. Using the best reason-based argument you can, can you help equip the audience here of how do they tell their friends on a secular type college campus no, there actually is a law, and if you follow it, it will actually make you more free. Can you help us walk through that? Yeah, no, this, this, this is a fabulous question. I think Saurabh and I both have a lot of thoughts on this, on this exact topic, actually. So there is this paradox, there is this, there is this mentality that has really kind of creeped in in the United States and a lot of Western civilization for the past half century, really more than that, the past century, century and a half at least, a lot of it is kind of is intellectually downstream of the Enlightenment, of particularly bad strands of Enlightenment thought, I would add. Uh, the Enlightenment's obviously complicated. The Scottish Enlightenment is a, a heck of a lot better, for example, than other strands. But let, let's simplify it and say that a lot of this kind of, uh, this intuition that we are free when we, are, when we have maximum consumer choice, that we are free when we can use whatever social media platform we want to realize uh, self-realization, self-potential. Uh, you know, I'm a, lawyer, I'm a lawyer by training, and one of the uh, more infamous Supreme Court cases of the past 30, 40 years, the Planned Parenthood versus Casey case, which effectively reaffirmed Roe versus Wade in 1992, uh, Anthony Kennedy has this 
utterly ridiculous passage. Lawyers call it the mystery passage, where he talks about how like the great achievement in human life, it's the eternal mystery, it's everyone's duty to define his or her own existence. Yes. That's kind of this mentality uh, to its climax, right? All of this is nonsense, and it explains a lot as to why Western civilization has just gone totally off the rails. Sorab has been adamant about this, probably more eloquent about it than basically anyone in this space, so I don't want to take up too much of his time, but there is a different conception of freedom. There's a different conception of freedom that is not just libertarian, live and let live. There's a different conception of freedom, that true freedom, that true liberty can only be attained and fulfilled through living a virtuous lifestyle with certain constrictions and parameters and barriers in place. When the, when the founders, you know, we speak of the founders in broad terms, the founders disagreed about this among themselves. Perhaps Jefferson, when he spoke of, uh, you know, self-evident truths, he had a, this more enlightenment, uh, motivated, kind of a strong form of Lockeanism. But there were other founders too, Alexander Hamilton, John Adams, who definitely adhered to this more traditional view of freedom. And, uh, you know, we see current uh, politicians today, a lot of what Senator Josh Hawley is doing, for instance, is really trying to, I think, kind of recover this definition of freedom. So that is what Sorab and I and a lot of our work are trying to do for sure. So, so Rob, I first became aware of you uh, during a debate where I thought I knew where I stood on the issue. Uh, because I was trained in the conservative movement in 2012, 13, and 14 to believe that freedom meant that a person should be able to do whatever they saw fit as long as it doesn't harm another person. And this really interesting debate kind of became front center in the conservative movement, which kind of started on the outer, like more wonky uh, areas, and it kind of moved into kind of the, the mainstream, which was, was this, should we as conservatives use political power to prevent drag queen story hour from happening at public libraries? And, and I, I thought I knew, I was like, oh yeah, freedom, how, what, you know, like, I don't like it, but who am I? And then I, I heard the very articulate argument for so Rob, and I won't dare steal the argument from you, but you won me over, and I think with millions of others, where all of a sudden, if we are not protecting and conserving tradition, if we're not even protecting our children, then what good are we actually doing? What, just walk us through that argument a little bit, and then the impact that it had. Yeah, so the argument was, and it's not just Drag Queen Story Hour, which as a, at the time I was a recent father, and it did outrage me, the fact that, um, you know, drag queens, um, I, I live in Manhattan, I actually happen to live literally above a, a drag bar, and, I, and, and Josh has seen it because he's at my place. You know, that's one thing because it's known as, okay, that's, that's where you go, you have your, like, if you're about to get married, you know, you have your bridal party at the drag, fine. But to then to say that this needs to be brought forth in front of children and to say, well, you know, this kind of, kind of frank, frankly, like transvestic fetishism should be normalized for kids outraged me as a father. Maybe it's because I'm from the Middle East, but I think a lot of Americans who aren't from the Middle East have the same intuition that there's something gone really wrong civilizationally when, we, when, we, when that happens and someone dressed in like latex boots up to here is reading books to toddlers is bizarre. And so I, I, I argued that some of this has to do with precisely what Josh said, is this account that freedom just means having maximal choice and having as much autonomy as you want. Um, and what that paradoxically does, because it gets rid of various traditional limits, um, it makes us less free. We see this in gender ideology uh, so much more, right? Gender ideology was initially began as this claim about, look, I, you know, I, I subjectively believe that I'm a woman, but I've been born into the body of the man. Why don't you recognize it and let me do what I want? It doesn't stop there because my demand for full autonomy begins to become, you have to recognize me as such. Therefore, you have to alter your language. Therefore, we have to create a new pronoun system. Therefore, you may be banned from social media if you use the wrong pronoun and so on and so forth. So I know she's speaking here when, when uh, Tommy Lauren said, well, why are people t picking on, on, on uh, Caitlyn Jenner? Uh, of course, we, or the per person formerly known as Bruce Jenner, of course we have to object to any kind of bullying or viciousness to anyone because everyone is born in the image of God. But why is it important? It's important because reality itself is at stake. Those traditional constraints preserved our ability to have access to reality and not to be forced to say something 
that is not true, such as the idea that a man can ultimately become a woman. No, gender differences are fundamental. You don't need to go to Genesis to know this. It's in genetics. And so, can I follow up on this? And I, I totally agree. And you know, we're, we're an educational organization, not commenting on politics. I said this on television, that a man who thinks that he's a woman has no place running in the Republican Party in any position whatsoever. And so, and so I, I, I want you to kind of help our audience here, though, because if they said what you and I just said, you, you know, you, you run like the oldest newspaper in the country, you know, I run Turning Point. In some ways, I'm not going to have to get some sort of crazy activist coming up to me in some, you know, North African lesbian poetry class at their school, right? So how are they supposed to defend their peers who will call them transphobic, who will call them hateful and bigoted that traditional gender roles, not just, tr let's forget traditional gender roles. How about like just a man is a man and a woman is a woman? Help equip our audience to be able to be prepared for that. Yeah, I mean, the, the language to use is the language of uh, of equal in dignity, but also different. Men and women have, have equal dignity, but they are different. And when you attempt to cross that boundary, it ends up in far worse coercion than what we had before. Again, it's the coercion that you face on campus. But I will say this, you and I, uh, and Josh, can withstand cancel pressure, right? When, the, when I work at the New York Post, when uh, the uh, uh, Hunter Biden story, which we did, I was not involved because I, I help run the opinion pages. When we did that, uh, as you remember, Facebook banned our, uh, uh, reduced circulation on our story, Twitter banned our account. You couldn't even use direct private messages to share our story, which remains to this day to be true. Hunter Biden has not said those were not emails, that was not my laptop. He could have done that 24 hours, two hours after the story dropped. They didn't. It was a true story that was censored. But look, we can fight back. I can go on Fox, my colleagues can go on Fox, we can make our case. And ultimately, we prevailed as much as you can, at least we, we got our account back and now you can share that story. But the ordinary person can't, which is why those of you who are concerned about tradition, as much as you have to show personal courage on campus or in your workplaces, we also have to seek political solutions. Because you, you're individually, we are too alone. We have to, the, the, the pressure of big tech um, is a matter of fundamental danger to, to what matters, political speech, right? Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act in, in 1996 was enacted in order to uh, uh, keep prurient content out of these bulletin boards like Facebook, like Twitter, which would come a few years later, um, but not to suppress political speech. Perversely now, they use Section 230 to repress conservative political speech but all sorts of prurient content can be found on, their, on these platforms. And that, uh, when you have especially the collusion of government, when you have the Biden administration telling these firms that you have to censor X, Y, and Z, you're dealing with something else. It's this blob of corporate government power and political action of the time that would have been recognizable to an Andrew Jackson is what we need. So Josh, I wanna kind of get into this because we have been told as conservatives, the only way to save the West is through cultural transformation and uh, being able to make better arguments. I agree with all of that. And as an evangelical, I think that we need to realize we're in a spiritual battle, not just in a material battle. And I think that, you know, in a, the, the specific, you know, uh, religious view that I have, that just, you know, talking about things that we can see is a mistake. However, so, so often conservatives say, well, I agree that drag queen story hour is wrong. I agree that, you know, I don't want to see men go into a restroom that's a woman's restroom, but who am I to legislate morality? Who am I to use political power? Josh, is it time to start using political power? Uh, the time for that has long since passed, I think, is, is, is the short answer. Look, anyone who is answering no to that question does not understand what time it is in America. Um, if, if you are looking at what is happening out there, we are obviously over 100 years into the Woodrow Wilson kind of, pro kind of progressive transformation, but this, this transformation happened quite a bit before then. But, you know, you can go back again to the writings of the American founders, a very kind of intellectually and politically diverse group, but they spoke all the time 
about the duty, the obligation of legislators, of lawmakers, to pursue a politics oriented towards human flourishing, justice, and the common good of the whole. The preamble of the United States Constitution enumerates seven substantive ends for governance. I, I don't have them all memorized verbatim, but a more perfect union, promote the general welfare, domestic tranquility, secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Which, by the way, that, that latter phrase is often, from my perspective, misinterpreted. A lot of people, you know, this became kind of like a running joke, like, you know, hashtag blessings of liber liberty in this drag queen story hour context. It's kind of like a Twitter meme at this point, but that's totally, totally wrong. If you actually look at what the, the, the phrase secure the blessings of liberty is saying, it's the blessings that they're trying to secure. The liberty is an instrumental means to achieve those substantive blessings, which of course are downstream of biblical principles. But more generally speaking here, look, you know, the, the late Andrew Breitbart, you know, may his, may his memory be a blessing, you know, famously said over and over and over again that politics is, uh, is downstream of culture. I guess my reaction to that is always, it, it's a two-way arrow. The two, like, very clearly do relate to one another. Um, I think legislators, I think po political statesmen, uh, even judicial statesmen, frankly, that our best judges, you know, Chief Justice John Marshall in the early 19th century, the greatest even justices have understood this, that there is a powerful role for the state to also use the levers, whether it's the political levers or the judicial opinion levers, to influence culture as well. And uh, look, we have to know what time it is in America. I realize I've said that already, but like that, you guys are the future. I mean, you have to look out there and see what the left has done. And, and I guess here's kind of the other thing I'll say about this. Look, Sorbs already talked about this a little bit. You know, Ronald Reagan famously said that the most terrifying words in the English language were, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. That probably was true at the, at the time he said that. I don't think that's true anymore. I think the most terrifying words in the English language in the year 2021 are, I'm from the ruling class and I'm here to subjugate you. That is what we see with this new Biden administration, uh, you know, countering domestic extremism document. That is what we see with this grotesque partnering with the federal government and big tech, most recently this, you know, Facebook COVID uh, misinformation stuff. We have to get in there. It is way past time for us to get comfortable using the levers of power to get in there and try to steer this ship back in a direction that is healthy, sustainable, again, towards those overarching substantive ends, justice, human flourishing, and the common good before it's too late. Just very quickly, to, to, to Republican legislators that say, legislators but also intellectuals of a kind of establishment, older generation who say, well, uh, my purpose in being in government is just to not use government power then why are you in government? I'm right. sorry, but in any civilization across all of human history, people go into government to use power. It's only this bizarre class of the, of the GOP establishment, I think, which relatively recently has convinced itself its role is to not use power. Of course, you have, and anyone who labors still under the idea that, you know what, the public square can be neutral. So and so can believe that there are 157 genders. I think there is only two sexes, but we can go, it doesn't work that way. Uh, and that's an obvious example. There are many others of this kind where we see that one way or another, some orthodoxy or other will be enshrined in the public square. So it might as well be a, a true orthodoxy, one that says that God is logos itself, reason itself, one that says that uh, uh, man and, and woman are made in the image of God and therefore they have an inherent dignity. That's the orthodoxy that the West has broadly speaking enshrined and should be enshrined again. Well, and, the, and the great irony of it is that each side did the opposite of what the other side was afraid of. And so, for example, it's now the left that is mandating vaccines and trying to control your body, which is what we're always accused of when it comes to the life argument. And we're the ones that are totally indifferent when you want to do something that is probably, you know, not good for society, which is always what we accuse the other side of doing, of kind of just being indifferent. It's this kind of, it's all the kind of accusations have now been kind of absorbed as kind of behavioral, you know, uh, traits in each side, which has been a really bizarre thing to see. So Rob, I want to ask you this as a follow-up though. Uh, someone like David French would say, who you know very well from your debates, you're nothing more than a central planner. You want to use political power because you don't trust people to have their own ability to self-govern. There's two statist movements and they, one calls themselves conservatives, one call themselves liberals. Is that true? Are we just central planners now? Is the era of big government here? I'm going to appeal to authority. 
I'm going to appeal to authority because someone like David French or other of, of my and Josh's um, kind of uh, interlocutors or uh, our critics in the conservative movements make this point. They say that it, we just, what we want to do is exhort people to virtue and just evangelize the culture and that will do its job. And I totally believe in evangelizing the culture. Of course, it's the Great Commission. In the Bible, our Lord says, go baptize nations in my name. That's fine. But the ancients never thought that mere evangelization or mere exhortation was enough. It had to have the force of law because most people, because of their fallen nature, need the guidance of law. The law is a teacher. St. Thomas says exhortations to virtue are good, but they're not enough. You also need some coercive dimension. And if you say, well, coercion is bad, go, well, guess what? You coerced one way or another. It, it, if you're afraid of, of government coercion, as Josh said, how much more should be afraid of a, of a coercion of, of a few Silicon Valley dweebs in Birkenstocks who wield enormous power to make unperson you, disappear you from the internet, and therefore so much of your identity is erased, and you don't have a Supreme Court to go to, you don't have a, a, a legislator to go to, it's a private company. So coercion is inevitable. Again, the only question is, what are you coercing for? What means are you using? Are you using them for reasonable ends or unreasonable ends? But the idea that you can have a society without coercion is fantasy. So Josh, what does this look like? So you say it's time to use political power. It's time for us to use the, the institutions and the instruments that were given to us. And by the way, I want to be very clear. When a conservative has political power, they did not stage a coup to get it. It was given to them by the consent of the governed. But what does that look like? Does that, because the fear, just so we're all clear, is some conservatives, and I hear you with this fear, they start, their alarm bells start to go off. It's a, it's a five alarm fire. They're like, road to surf to F.A. Hayek, tans, tanks in the streets, surveillance state, 1984, we can't do that, we might as well do nothing. What do we do? Right, so, I mean, part of this depends on the, in, in which sphere of government we're talking about. So, you know, on the state level, a lot of the action nowadays is obviously at the state level. Um, look, there's a debate right now on the right as to whether we should like, actually ban the indoctrination of critical race theory, of, which is effectively anti-white, anti-Christian, anti-Jewish racism, as far as I see. It, whether we should actually use the powers of the state to ban this outright or to just let it be. Um, you know, the, the, the predictable actors have all taken their kind of usual battle lines in this debate. Um, the short answer is, of course, we should ban critical race theory. Um, of, you know, of, I mean, properly, this is... This is, you know, hold aside the fact that it's already illegal under Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, but of course we should feel comfortable at a state level banning the racial indoctrination of our children to hate their heritage, to hate their race and all of that. At a local kind of municipal governance level, of course we should get on board with banning drag queen story hours. And then at the federal level, you know, we talked about the tech issue. The, the big tech issue, one of the reasons that I find it so interesting is really is kind of the tip of the spear for this kind of broader discussion here. It really is kind of... Big tech is the ruling class's quote-unquote private sector enforcement arm. That's, ex that's exactly what happened to Sarah about the New York Post with this Hunter Biden story. You know, I call it their Pearl Harbor attack at the time when Facebook and Twitter kind of, it seemed to me, to kind of gang up and suppress this Hunter Biden story. Little did I know that literally, you know, two and a half months later in January, after January 6, what happened to Parler? It was, it was naked collusion. It was literally naked collusion from Apple, Amazon, and Google to do that. So what do we do about that? Well. It's kind of an all of the above strategy. We talked about Section 230 reform. Any conservative, you know, who calls himself conservative, who does not see the imperative of trying to get rid of, of big tech's gratuitous Section 230 immunity, again, does not see what time it is. And there are other things, too. We need to get more comfortable with antitrust enforcement, for example. There's a very long Republican Party tradition of antitrust, by the way. It was literally a Republican policy when, when it was founded. Uh, John Sherman, who gave his name to the Sherman Antitrust Act, uh, was, was the brother of William Tecumseh Sherman, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the famous general for the Union in the Civil War. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt, of course, was a Republican, the great trust buster. And then, of course, there's a common carrier regulation as well, which Justice Clarence Thomas had a fabulous recent Supreme Court writing on. These are all things that I'm thinking about, that I'm writing about, but big tech is really the tip of the spear at a federal level for kind of putting this into action, I think. So, so Rob, uh, you know, a lot of these students here are going to go back to campus for the first time in a long time, and they're going to come back to a campus environment 
for some of them it will be even more hostile and even just quite honestly unrecognizable. I think that just to put yourself in their shoes, many of these students kind of had a half campus experience this last semester with very little activism uh, on campus for obvious you know, virus protocol reasons. Some students were online, but this is the first semester where it's gonna be college again for the first time in almost a year and a half. And since then, we saw the BLM Incorporated kind of, uh, you know, just, I could call it a revolution almost in the last year, not for the better. Um, and so a lot of the students here are going to be asked the question in their class and from their friends, why is this civilization worth saving? It's colonialist, misogynistic, hateful, homophobic. Don't you realize this is nothing more than an oppressor and oppressed scheme? Give them a little bit here of how they can deal with that because they are constantly bombarded with this line of propaganda. Well, I mean, I, you, you, have to, you have to defend the West. But what I would do is I would defend the West rightly understood. And again, I, I will repeat this, Greek philosophy, yes. Judeo-Christian religion, and Roman law, that combination. And it's, the, it's, it, it's a source of an incredibly humane civilization. It's a source, as I said, of a civilization that says that, that, uh, that God so loved the world that he sent his only son. And that son, that, that, that person is truth, is reason itself. Now, now, if you do that, then you, you, don't, you, you can be nuanced. You, you, you know, they, they bring up some colonial crime. You say, yeah, that was bad. It fell short of what the civilization, uh, civilization's true meaning was, but also then put it into perspective next to civilizations that, that, that didn't have that. And so the barbarism, uh, uh, you know, of the, of the Roman Empire before, before its uh, conversion in some ways. As, as, as wonderful as, of a civilization it was, it also had its barbarous aspects or, or uh, you know, uh, the, the kind of civilizations of the Americas before the uh, uh, arrival. I mean, there, were, there was brutality there. But you can judge it all next to the absolute standard of truth rather than trying to apologize for everything. You don't have to apologize. There's some things that were bad. So, so Josh, in closing here, um, there's, there's this narrative that continues, which is that freedom is being able to do whatever you wish. We touched on this earlier. If you go to the Harvard Law School in one of their cor you know, stairwell corridors, they have this big saying that says the law is the wise restraints that keep men free. So I want everyone to think about this, yeah. that it's the restraints that you put on yourself that keep you free. It's not doing what you want to do that keeps you free. How do we take back the word of freedom? Because I think we have allowed these beautiful words of liberty and freedom, which are the Greek words eleutheria and isonomia, we've allowed it to be corrupted into almost indulgence. Some would call it licentiousness. How do we take that back? And then it's hard for an 18 and 19 year old because yeah. there's kind of this I'm bulletproof and I walk on water mentality. How do we, how do we win that argument? Yeah, and it's kind of a million dollar question, obviously. First of all, I'm shocked that that uh, Harvard Law School... Uh, It'll be removed soon. I, yeah, I keep I, mentioning it. It's just exactly. Harvard will take that down in a blazing glory soon. Yeah, no, I'm shocked it's not already canceled, to be honest with you. Um, but, I mean, that was effectively, that quote right there, that was the consensus. I mean, that was the way that human beings, whether in Jerusalem, Athens, Rome, at English common law, you know, the United States, obviously, we inherited the English common law. It's still kind of our, our state-level law for property torts, all this stuff. The English common law was emphatically based on the quotation that Charlie's just said there, that without restraints, without kind of an inherent orientation towards societal, national interest, common good oriented virtue, that the law itself um, was not true law, that it was not substantive law. Yes. Um, so how do we actually kind of go ahead and take that back? Well, you know, I, I don't have all the answers, but I can just give a couple of ideas here. I mean, like, like I said, you know, there are, I think, some legislators, there are some politicians who I think get this. The fact that, that, that in kind of a hands-off approach to big tech is increasingly anathema in the Republican Party is great. It's a great place to start, I think. But it ultimately, and so I've kind of hinted at this earlier, it has to go beyond that. The threat of woke capital, the threat of corporate power in general in America is very real. And I think there was a time, you know, where it probably made sense for the American right, for the GOP establishment, for the Chamber of Commerce, et cetera, to kind of get in bed and cozy up one another because, you know, the corporations would promise more choice, more consumer choice, you know, lower prices, right? All this kind of like neoliberal uh, fantasies that we were sold. Uh, and, and what was the result of that? 
what was the result of kind of this maximal bipartisan neoliberalism? An unprecedented opioid crisis, ripping apart the industrial heartland, job shifts like you've never seen to China, to say nothing, of course, of, of Mexico and countries in our own hemisphere. So we have to kind of just talk about and just get there in the public discourse through conversations just like this. At the, at the federal government level, level uh, senators like Josh Hawley are kind of already saying things along these lines that freedom is only, is only true freedom insofar as we are looking out for the common good of the whole, insofar as we are expressly legislating and enacting policies oriented towards that. So Tom Cotton's another example, and I'll, I'll just end on this note. He has a recent kind of policy proposal, I don't remember the exact details, but he basically would just, uh, would tax Harvard, Princeton, Yale, et cetera, their endowments, and then directly take that money to provide better access to kind of technical training, community college. These are exactly the sort of policies that we should be looking at, whether they call us status authoritarians, leftist central planners, who cares? That's what we have to do. That is a time in America, and we can only just encourage you with conversations like this. So here's how I want to close. I know that we're going a little over time. First, if you want to hear this conversation and the extended backstage conversation, uh, if you guys can hear it on the Charlie Kirk Show podcast. Thank you for subscribing to it. And if you guys aren't yet subscribed, if everyone in this room subscribed, uh, we would beat Rachel Maddow in the New York Times and the podcast charts. So that would mean, if you take out your phone and subscribe, it would mean a lot. And we're going to have some backstage conversations that we're looking forward to diving deeper. Here's how I want to end this conversation. So Rob, talk about what your faith has meant for you. Talk about your faith journey. I know we have like 30 to 45 seconds. Um, and just because some people out here might be drifting away from their faith. They might have been raised Catholic. They might have went to a Catholic school and they're like, ah, I don't want to get involved in that. Talk about your own personal story. Sure. I mean, I, I converted uh, in, in December 2016. Um, and I mean, I was, thank you. I, I, I don't, I, you know, the church needs the claps, not me. Um, but what, what it's meant to me is, you know, frankly, I mean, I, I, look, I was living my 20s. I was working as a, as a journalist in, in New York and London, but um, had this sense that there's more to life. And that sense found its, its fulfillment um, ultimately at the altar. And since this is a panel about tradition, tradition, the best definition I've encountered, it's the shortest, is tradition is ordered continuity. That is, you have this sense that there's, there are steps leading behind you, therefore steps leading in front of you and to live within the bounds of tradition you actually get a lot of confidence right if i if, 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 that i know what i am i am a man and i will f find my true fulfillment in family life in having children and and that allows me to actually be free to leap forward and i can uh, uh, kind of eliminate a lot of distractions that i actually don't need once you do that rather than being like looking inside yourself hmm who am i what do i really believe there, there, there are certain truths, really fundamental truths, that have been handed down. That's tradition. Traditio is to hand down. And you don't, so you don't have to explore your I insides for wisdom. You probably won't find it there. Um, uh, uh, when you have this, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. That's the beauty of, of all tradition. And speaking of things that are traditional, uh, basically the world's first religion, tell us about your, your, your faith and what it's meant for you, Josh. Sure. So, you know, I, I, I mentioned Edmund Burke in passing earlier. I, I mean, Edmund Burke was not Jewish, to be, <laughs> to be clear. But um, he did famously speak of um, this notion of a partnership among the generations, dead, dead, living, and, and, uh, and unborn. Um, that is how I think about politics, and that's how I think about religion in general. Um, I, I take an immense amount of pride and joy, frankly, in the fact that as a Jew, I can directly trace my lineage to Revelation at Sinai. It's, it's an incredibly powerful thing for me. Um, and, uh, you know, look, I, I, I grew up in, personally in a fairly kind of secular home. I, mean, I grew up in a, in, a, in a Jewish home that would really only go for kind of the high holidays, Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah. As I've, as I've gotten older, you know, now when I travel for conferences like this, when I go speaking and stuff, I always travel with, uh, with my sitter, with my prayer book, with my tefillin, which is what Jews always, uh, every day, they, they wrap themselves with. It's part of the the uh, liturgical morning prayer, the Shakarit service. And what I've learned, and it's kind of similar really to what Sorab said, is that you are not prepared, especially in this line of business, Charlie, in, in this line of business, you are like not prepared. We are not prepared to go out there and do kind of intellectual fisticuffs, to kind of engage in the, in, in the public square, to, to uh, duke it out in the battle of ideas. If you don't have something to point to, you need something in there to guide you, to sustain you, to look at every single day. Um, 
I, you know, as I've become more observant over the past few years, as, you know, as, I've, as, as I've come to kind of pray every day, I find that. Um, and you know, I, I only hope that all of you can find that as well. It's wonderful. Uh, I want to keep talking to these two, and you guys can hear that exclusive stuff if you check out the podcast. For me personally, I gave my life to Christ in fifth grade. Uh, it's meant more every single year as I've gotten older. And it's been the most amazing thing. And I totally agree, Josh. If, in this space, if you don't have something anchoring you, uh, and that means a personal relationship with Christ and realizing that I am not enough, that salvation is not going to be earned and checking a bunch of boxes, um, but instead being obedient and accepting Christ into my life and making him the chairman of the board of all of my decisions and everything that I do. And uh, so I just want to say that this kind of conversation uh, is really unique and we need more of it. And I don't think we disagreed on basically anything. <laughs> Uh, but for all of you guys out here, the big takeaways are respect tradition, um, to know that road ahead, ask those coming back. And Lord Falkland famously said that if it's not necessary to change things, it's necessary not to change them. And I think all of you can be articulate and compassionate, yet firm and courageous spokespeople for this beautiful gift that we have been given, which is Western civilization. Quite honestly, the greatest experiment in self-government in human history. And that's really what we're fighting here for at Turning Point USA to save the West. God bless you guys. Thank you so much. I'm Isabel Brown, one of our Turning Point USA contributors, and I'm just here to thank you so much for your ongoing support of all things TPUSA. I got my start on my college campus starting a chapter, so I know firsthand just how important the work that we do on the ground of America's college campuses is every single day. Now doing what I do as a contributor, I get to reach hundreds of thousands of people every day, including with my new shows in the TPUSA Productions Department. Your ongoing support means that we can start new shows and new chapters all over the country. You can make a donation to Turning Point USA at tpusa.com slash donate. YWLS, if you were in Dallas, raise your hand. Yeah, all the lovely ladies. We got men here this time. I heard you guys had some fun last night at the Embassy Suites, right? <laughs> oh, who said conservatives don't party, am I right? Well, hey, I got to tell you guys, there's one thing that I really wish because it would make our lives so much easier. I really wish that liberals were as stupid as we thought they were. I really wish that. It would make our lives so much easier, but I'll tell you this, liberals are a lot smarter than we give them credit for, and what they've been able to do in our country for the last year and a half has been astonishing. The way that they have been able to convince us to give up our rights because that would somehow be in our best interest is astonishing. The way that they've been able to convince you to close your businesses, to not go to work, to wait for a government check, to hang upon their every word to make your own decisions about your own health and wellness is amazing. When you think about everything that we have given up in the last year and a half, the fundamental changes that have happened to our country, it's terrifying. But the one thing that the liberals did not count on is they did not count on all of you being as intelligent as you are. They didn't count on people like you standing up and fighting back. They counted on people like you and young people to sit back and shut up and take orders. And I can tell by the looks of everybody here that you guys are not willing to do that. So congratulations to you, first and foremost, for making that decision. But some of the things that they've been able to do to our country are astonishing and they're, they're terrifying. And I know a lot of folks are really upset about what happened in 2020, as am I. And I know a lot of folks have been very disappointed and they felt as though our country is being lost in a lot of ways 
There have been a lot of horrible things happening, but I gotta tell you, and I hope that you're with me on this, I love my country more now than I did on the day Donald Trump was elected. And the reason I love my country more now than even on the day Donald Trump was elected is because I think we know now what we have to lose, what we've given away, and what we have to fight like hell to get back. The mission is before us now. Because let's be honest, for those four great years when we had Donald Trump as our president, a lot of us got really lazy in this movement. We expected him to fight all of our battles for us. We sat back, we wore our mega hats, but did we really fight for freedom? Did we really fight for conservatism and capitalism? Did we really fight for all the things that made this country great? A lot of us didn't. A lot of us were really proud to have Donald Trump fighting all those battles at our borders, in the streets, when it comes to law and order, when it comes to low taxes, when it comes to getting rid of infringements and tyranny and regulation. We relied on Donald Trump to do that, and he did an amazing, amazing job with that. But now we don't have Donald Trump anymore. Will he come back? We don't know. Maybe. We'll wait to see. But we can't rely on Donald Trump, and we can't rely on whoever's next, whoever next we put in the White House, which I believe we're going to. We can't rely on them. Because I'll tell you what, liberals understand one thing better than we do. They understand how to reach the most vulnerable, and they understand how to change the conversation in that way. And that's why they go after young people, and that's why indoctrination is such a problem. I know you all know that. I know that you all are either in high school, or you're in college, or you're recently graduated, and you just entered the workforce. You understand the pull of things like social socialism. You understand wokeism. You understand what they're trying to do. But some of your classmates, some of your peers, some of your family members, they don't understand that. So it's up to you guys to all take on this mission that lies before us because it's going to be a rough couple of years. We're going to watch the liberals, the Democrats, the leftists, the progressives. We are going to watch them actively divide our country. We're going to watch them do whatever they can to cheat to win. And they're going to expect you to sit down and shut up and let it happen. And they're going to use intimidation and they're going to use cancel culture to make it happen. And that's one of the things we have to speak out about more than ever because cancel culture affects us all in this room, but it especially impacts young people. Because if there's one thing that young people want right now, it's to fit in and to belong to something. And that's what liberalism offers. That's what socialism offers. That's what communism offers. But we have to remind people that the greatest gift you can give yourself and others is freedom and liberty and limited government. And if we lead with that message, we can get more people on the right side. But we have to be spreading that message and we have to make ourselves uncancelable. And the only way to make yourself uncancelable is to stand up and to speak out and to do it proudly, to do it boldly, to do it unabashedly, because every time you sit back and you shut up, you let them get another W in their column. You effectively cancel yourselves. We do it to ourselves every day. There are forces in this country that are teaching, especially young people, how to hate the country that they live in. Now, keep in mind, the people that are teaching you to hate the country that you live in are also living in this country and taking advantage of this country. And BLM, a terrorist organization, is a prime example of that. They're making millions and millions of dollars off of their hatred of this country in which they live and in which they're profiting off of. If you watch the BLM movement and what they've been able to do, especially in the last few years, it's amazing because they have coordination and they have people that are unwilling to speak out and say, hey, this organization was supposed to be this and now it's that because they've canceled all the dissenting voices. But what worries me most in this country, besides the onset of socialism that we're seeing and it's in front of us, is the way in which they're going about it and they're making us hate our country, this country that we love. But another thing that they're doing, and they've been doing it steadily for the last five years, is they've been going after those who protect, serve, and defend our nation. I'm talking about our law enforcement officers. And as you guys know, that's one of my biggest things. And if you are in law enforcement, you want to be in law enforcement, you have a family member, a loved one in law enforcement, if you could raise your hand so everybody knows who you are. I know that there are probably so many in this room. I don't want to thank you guys for everything that you've done because I know that it can't be easy for the families of law enforcement right now and what the left is doing 
to those individuals. But make no mistake, it's not that the left doesn't want law and order. They want law and order. They just don't want law and order in the hands of your loved ones, in the hands of your moms and your dads, people that are protecting our communities at a local level. They don't want that control and that law and order in their hands. They don't want it in the hands of patriots who understand what service means. They want law and order in the hands of the federal government and even worse, the global government. So everything that they're doing right now, the chaos that they're creating in the streets, it might look like they don't know what they're doing. It might look like they've maybe overplayed their hand and they're going to pay for it in the midterms, and I think they will. But make no mistake, everything that's going on is very, very calculated. And you have to watch it and you have to pay attention to it because if we don't understand what we're doing, what they're doing, and we pass it all off as they're being ridiculous, they don't understand, they're losing their base, they're not losing their base. They're slow and they're methodical. But what they're doing is they started with the demonization of law enforcement. Then they move to decriminalization. So all those things that used to be felonies, now they're misdemeanors. You want to loot the footlocker? Misdemeanor. You want to loot the target? A misdemeanor. You want to resist arrest? Hey, that's justice. They're changing the meaning of words. So they demonize law enforcement. They say that law enforcement is systemically racist and bad. Then they decriminalize to make it easier to break the laws that they don't respect anyway. And then they move to defunding. So now they want to cut off the resources. And they do all of this to create mass chaos. Because when you have mass chaos in the streets, when you have what appears to be lawlessness, that's when the government thrives most. So watch it happen in our streets and pay attention. And when people see it happening and they're looking at what's happening, you remind them that this is all part of their plan. And it's not just lawlessness in our streets and our community, it's also lawlessness at our southern border. We're set to welcome already almost a million people into this country. It is July. It is July. They estimated this year we might welcome a million illegal immigrants. It's July. We've almost already welcomed a million illegal immigrants in this country. We're a country that loves immigrants, don't get me wrong, but we're a country that also values law and order, and we value doing things the right way. But this is another plan of the left. The left knows that they really can't win on their messaging. They know that they really can't win on high taxes, high gas prices, high lumber prices, inflation. Those things are really hard to sell to the American people. So what are they going to do? They're going to do everything they can to change the rules. They're going to do everything they can through this Voting Rights Act because they want to bring as many illegal immigrants into this country as possible. And mark my words, pretty soon it's amnesty, pretty soon it's voting rights. And then all of us sitting in this room, even if we want to get this country back, we're really going to have a hell of a time doing it because once you bring millions of people into this country who are beholden to the Democratic Party, it makes it really, really difficult to get our footing back. That's why this moment is more important than ever, heading into midterms, heading into 2024. We need to make sure that we drain the swamp, which Donald Trump started to do, but we have to finish draining that swamp. There are a lot of Republicans there that are really comfortable doing what they're doing every single day, and they're really comfortable not doing a whole lot for you. And they're really comfortable just blaming the Democrats for all of their inaction. But there are things we can do, and it's going to start with young people like you. It's going to start in your high schools. It's going to start in your college campuses. It's going to start in your workplaces. And the only way that we're going to be able to change this narrative and truly fight that good fight is if we start talking to liberals more. It's great when we talk to each other. It's great when we have great conversations with like-minded individuals. It's great to exist in an echo chamber because it's very comfortable. But the only way we're going to win the culture war and the only way we're going to take the country back is if we start talking to liberals and explaining to them that it's in their best interest to not only love the country that they live in, but believe in limited government. Another way we can do it, and I'm so happy to see it today, unmasked and at full capacity, but we really do have to start speaking about our rights and our freedoms that are being taken away. How many of you are from California? You live in California. You're in LA. Yeah, you guys got masks again. Are any of you surprised? Any of you surprised you have masks again? Of course not. Is it, back, is it backed up with science? Absolutely not. You know what it's backed up with? Democrats who love control. There's nothing more than Democrats like to see than a mask across your face. If you're vaccinated, you're unvaccinated, they don't care. Because they look at you and they go, you're driving with a mask on alone. You're sleeping with a mask on. You're double masked. You're triple masked. We won everything that happened in the last year and a half with the pandemic, and a lot of it some of it was necessary to keep us safe. We didn't know what this was. But a lot of it was Democrats testing how far they could go, how far they could push you. What can we get the sheep of this country to do? How far can we push them? How many rights can we convince them to give up? And guess what? We all look stupid because we gave them way too much. And now we have to fight to get them back. 
And there's another thing that I'll tell you, and it goes for the First Amendment, it goes for the Second Amendment, it goes for all of our rights, and it goes for everything that we gave up during the pandemic. Once you start giving your rights away, it is really difficult to get them back. So remember that next time you're willing to cede some of them to the government, because you're going to have to really fight to get them back. That's very important when it comes to the Second Amendment as well. Look at Cuba right now. Do you think the people in Cuba wish they had a Second Amendment? They absolutely do. They wish they had the freedoms that we have here, the freedoms that we're giving away every single day. They wish that they had them. That's why they carry that American flag. That's why they believe in the beacon that the United States of America is. Better than some of us even understand. You look at those people and you look at what they're fighting for and for the first time they looked at their regime and they looked at communism and they said, you know what, I'm not going to just try to get on a raft and come to the United States of America. I'm going to stay in my country and I'm going to fight for it. And boy, wouldn't it be nice if we got some of that spirit back? They want to get here. But make no mistake, the people in Cuba are also understanding what's happening in this country and they're saying, wait, wait, wait a minute. All we wanted to do was get to the United States, and now we're looking at the United States, and they're doing the exact thing that we're fleeing from. And that is another part of the reason that they're standing up and saying, no more. You can only push us around so long. We can learn something from the Cuban people. We can stop, and we can listen, and we can understand how good we have it. This is still the greatest nation on the face of the earth, even though we have slow dementia Joe in office. We elected him, remember? If you wonder why Republicans and conservatives are so confused and so interested in getting to the bottom of voter fraud, it's because it's very hard for us to believe that the American people, 80 million people, voted to put somebody in office who can't form a complete sentence. It's astonishing to us. We gotta look into it. We gotta look into election integrity. And that's another thing, by the way, that they're trying to cancel, and they use January 6th to do it. And if you watch the mainstream media, they do it very well. Anytime somebody talks about voter fraud or election integrity, they want to label them an insurrectionist like they're going to storm the Capitol. No, we're not going to do that, but for damn sure we're going to look into what was going on with voting machines. For damn sure we're going to look at what's going on with ballot harvesting and everything that they're trying to push upon us now. Because if they change the rules midstream, once again, it's going to be really difficult for us to get this country back. But I want you guys also, when you leave here, I want you to have a clear mission statement of what you want to do. But I also want you to leave with kindness in your heart and understand that though we have a lot of disagreements with our fellow Americans, we don't hate our fellow Americans. We don't hate liberals. We don't hate Democrats. We don't even hate Nancy Pelosi or Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez or Kamala Harris. We don't hate any of them. We show them kindness because we want to teach them that freedom is worth fighting for. And somewhere along the way, they forgot that because of power, money, greed, and control. But we can remind people, you can remind people, you're with people every single day, you're with young people, and you have the ability to change the narrative and to change the conversation, but you have to do it with kindness, and you have to do it with a clear mission, and you have to do it with freedom in your heart, and you have to bust out of your echo chamber, and you have to talk to people who don't think like you do. But another thing that you have to do is you have to be unafraid of offending people who have no fear of offending you. Too often, conservatives sit back. Conservatives sit back and they say, I I'm afraid to tell people that I voted for Donald Trump. I'm afraid to tell people that I'm a conservative because I don't know how they're going to take it. I don't know how it's going to affect my friends, my family, my grades, my job. It really is a risk assessment that you have to make for yourself. But I'll tell you this, the liberals, they're not afraid of offending you. They will put their Black Lives Matter sign in their yard, in, their, in your face, right up against your nose, all day, every day, because they don't care if they offend you. But you're so afraid of offending them. Why? With the truth? With what you believe in? Why have you been taught that your beliefs and your values and your traditions are not worth fighting for, or that there's something that you can only talk to like-minded people about? That's BS, and it's what's caused us to be in this situation where we're fighting to get our country back. I want to thank you guys so much for being here, for doing what you do, for speaking up and speaking out, for being proud of who you are. Always be proud of what you believe in. Always be proud of the movement that you represent, but represent it well. Represent it with love, with kindness, with freedom, with patriotism. And show people that this country is indeed the greatest nation on the face of the earth. It's worth fighting for, and it's worth taking back. You've seen what we've lost. You've seen what we have to lose. And you see the mission that lies in front of you. So go forth and do it, and do it wholeheartedly, do it unabashedly, do it uncensored, unfiltered, and do it 
to every capacity that you possibly can because this is the fight of our lives. We have this opportunity right now. Don't sit back five years from now and say, boy, I wish we would have done something sitting back in 2021. And do it without a mask on your face, by the way. Never let them put you back in those. Thank you guys so much. It was great to see you. Please welcome to the stage, Congresswoman Lauren Boebert. I said, you are the future. They said, no, ma'am. We are the now. You are the now. Now, there's a lot going on in our nation today. A million things have been running through my mind. But it is so great to be here with freedom-loving, Fauci-hating, gun-toting, based free thinkers like all of you. I had the honor and the privilege of joining most of you, a lot of you ladies, at the Young Women's Leadership Summit in Dallas. How amazing it is to have a group of conservative people who are allowed to have the freedom of thought, who are allowed to debate ideas, who are allowed to persevere and pursue their dreams. You all rock. You're amazing. And I am so honored to be a part of everything you're doing. Well done at spreading this conservative movement. Now, there's a couple things that I want to charge you with today. I need you. No. America needs you to be bold. Let me tell you about boldness. So many people want you to go and run and hide in a quarter. But God created you with a spirit of boldness, not a spirit of timidity, not a spirit of fear, but a spirit of love and power and of a sound mind. That is how you were created. And boldness isn't just in politics. Boldness starts right at home. I am a mom of four boys. And for me, that is the greatest honor that I have. When I was a stay-at-home mom, it was some of the sweetest times in my life. Don't ever let anyone diminish the role of being a mom. That is the most powerful thing that you can do. Ladies, 
You want to be an influencer? When you grow up and you have your family, influence your children. That is the best influence you can have. And men, be a good dad. Be a strong husband. Be a leader. We can all have tough skin. Men, you can be masculine, that's okay. I'm raising my boys to be men before liberals try to turn them into women. We can be tough on the outside, but have a tender heart. That's why we are here, because we care. I fight Democrats all the time. Look, I may be little, but I have punch above my weight class. I like to punch up a little. Democrats hate everything that we're doing because it's productive, because it's good for the country, it's good for the world, it's good for the soul. And they can't stand it. They can't stand, stand freedom, loving Americans like you, free thinkers like you. I took that boldness that I want you to have and I put it into starting a business. I didn't know what that was gonna be like. Everyone told me, you can't do this. You can't start a business right now. The city manager said, your business will fail if you open it right now. But I put my faith and trust in God. And I said, if I commit my actions to the Lord, my plans will be successful. And now Shooter's Grill has been open for eight years. We have employed hundreds of young women who I had the honor of counseling at the Garfield County Jail. Women who society had given up on. They said, there's no hope for you. But I was able to go into that jail and minister to these women and give them hope that their failures didn't limit their future. I went in and I personally introduced these women to the God who could turn their shame into glory, who could restore their past and lead and guide and launch them into a successful future. I had boldness when I heard the Democrats start saying the quiet parts out loud. Beto O'Rourke, from a presidential debate stage, said, hell yes, we're taking your guns. And so with that spirit of boldness, I drove three hours to his presidential rally with my Glock on my hip. And I looked him in the eye and I told him, hell no, you're not. And if you don't believe me, just watch. White House hopeful Beto O'Rourke making gun confiscation his rally cry on the campaign trail. But one woman is not giving up her firearm so easily. I am here to say, hell no, you're not. I have four children, I'm five foot zero, 100 pounds, cannot really defend myself with a fist. I want to know how you're going to legislate that because a criminal by defense breaks the law. So all you're going to do is restrict law abiding citizens like myself. Hey, Joe Biden. If you want to go after guns, if you want to go after gun control like Beto O'Rourke's trying to do, how about you start with your crackhead, Parmesan-smoking, gun criminal son, Hunter Biden? to this journey to run for Congress because it was selfish of me to sit at home and do nothing. When I saw so many millions of people agree with how I was feeling, I said someone has to step up. Everyone wanted to limit me. It's not your turn. Run for county commissioner, run for city council, run for school board, maybe go on the PTA. Hey, that stuff's all important. But we needed a leader in a big way in Colorado because Colorado is turning blue fast. I took out a five-term incumbent, the first time in 48 years that an incumbent lost a primary in Colorado.
We were not supposed to win. I am not supposed to be here, but I had thousands of supporters. Not thousands of dollars, really, but all of the support that we needed to send us over. And this has never been about me. This is about liberty. This is about freedom. The American dream, this is about you. And that's why this movement is not slowing down. And that right there is where boldness becomes perseverance. I need you all to persevere in everything that you do. Every day that I'm in Congress, I persevere knowing the end goal, seeing the end from the beginning, knowing that we have the victory, knowing that God said in Exodus 14 that he will fight for you. He will hold your peace. When I have a bold idea, I am able to persevere because that idea is usually bigger than me. And I know if it's bigger than me, God has to be involved. It's interesting, right after God said that to Moses, he said, why are you crying out to me? Tell the people, go forward. What is in your hand? And he lifted up that staff. So I'm telling you all now, be bold, persevere, and go forward with what is in your hand right now. That perseverance allows me to take on AOC, Sandri Ca Ca Castro, <laughs> And her 11 million followers, when they try to say that communism is a good thing. Those policies are not working for the people in Cuba right now. And Cubans are not waving the hammer and sickle. They are waving old glory. God bless America. Cubans know that that is the symbol for liberty and justice for all. From Cuba to Hong Kong, they want freedom. And they know that government crumbs are never enough to satisfy the human desire for liberty. So that perseverance allows me to endure Speaker Pelosi and her nonsense, AOC and her squad, and even the chairman of the Really Bad Hair Caucus, who said I led a reconnaissance tour in the United States Capitol when I brought my boys in to see where mom was gonna be working. <laughs> chairman of the Bad Hair Caucus right there, guys, eating chicken. I, I think it's actually crow is what he's eating. <laughs> but you all have that same fight in you. And the American dream is what we need to keep alive. Cubans are crying out for our freedom right now. All over the world, people want the freedom that you have. It is because of the American dream that I am here today. I was raised in a Democrat household because my mom believed the lies she was told by corrupt politicians. Greedy politicians who only wanted power. Democrats don't want independence. They have declared dependency. And that's what they did with our family. Growing up, I stood in line for bread, for government cheese, and that is not America's best. At 11 years old, I knew that there was something better. And when I got my first job at the Rifle McDonald's and I put my hand to something and created wealth, I learned at a young age that I could do a better job taking care of myself than government ever could. Now because of that spirit of boldness and because I persevered, I went from standing in line waiting for government cheese 
to being a United States Congresswoman. Y'all like him? He's pretty cool, huh? That's my president. <laughs> this American dream is alive for all of you. I want to leave you with this. Our founding fathers had such faith, had such faith in God and such faith in each other and such faith to have a nation that glorified God and embodied freedom, that they declared their independence. And then they celebrated that independence before they were free. And after they celebrated, knowing there was no turning back, they went and started the battle. They declared the end from the beginning, knew that God would fight this battle for them. And they did not stop until they had obtained that freedom. And when they created government, they didn't reimpose oppression upon themselves. They wrote a beautiful document, the Constitution, and said, this nation will be free and the people will rule this nation. Government is here, is instituted to secure the self-evident rights of the people. Did you know that? Your rights are self-evident. You don't need Nancy Pelosi to explain to you what your rights are. They are self-explanatory. Now, normally, I tell government, we don't want your welfare. We don't want your handouts. We are rugged individuals who can take care of ourselves. We want you to leave us the hell alone. But today I'm going to tell you, I want you in government space. I want you running for school board. I want you running for council. I want you running for student body president. I want you involved all over this nation. Let them know that this movement is not going anywhere. We are rising up. We are unified and we will win. We are taking our country back. God bless America. Welcome to the stage, James O'Keefe. No, no one ever says those things out loud, but it's obvious. It's the thing that keeps you tuned in. If it bleeds, it leads. If it bleeds, it leads. So I think that's probably it. Yeah. Twitter permanently suspended his account after he exposed hypocrisy and fraud at CNN. But Project Veritas, a very controversial conservative group, promoting misinformation. The Times reported that the footage from Project Veritas was part of a, quote, coordinated disinformation campaign. They sued the New York Times for defamation. Project Veritas just won a major victory in that case. When they come to you and offer you $100 million, you're not going to settle? I, 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 <laughs> so tell them to go to hell. Go to hell. Go to hell.
special treat for you here today because today for the first time ever Project Veritas is going to release a brand new whistleblower on stage at the end of this presentation and that whistleblower that whistleblower is backstage right now so that's coming at the end and we have a few other surprises for you so let's get started dancing in plates is not easy so, as you all know, we sued the New York Times for defamation. And, uh, you know, we uh, essentially, we, we, they wrote an article about us saying that we're a coordinated disinformation campaign. They defended their statements by saying they're just opinion writers, but Project Veritas won a huge victory in that defamation lawsuit. The judge in New York State had this to say about the New York Times, which was engaged in deception and disinformation. The articles that are the subject of this action called the video, quote, deceptive, but the dictionary definitions of, quote, disinformation and deceptive provided by defendants' counsel certainly apply to Astor's and Shoe's failure to note that they injected their opinions in news articles as they now claim. It was the New York Times that was deception and disinformation. Laura Logan did a piece this week. She talked about the lawsuit and talked about the admissions that the New York Times made when they were under oath in court. O'Keefe is eager to depose the New York Times reporters and have his day in court. Unsurprisingly, the Times is appealing, but already had to make what some would call startling admissions. And the New York Times said that the woman's not an opinion writer, who was a reporter for the New York Times, also said the Times didn't even ask them for comment when they wrote their article, didn't even pick up the phone. This is the journalism that we did in Minnesota showing that voter fraud was actually something that was real. The New York Times called us coordinated disinformation, and they admitted in the lawsuit that, in fact, it was illegal what was happening, more than three absentee ballots. So Project Veritas, oh, well, the New York Times also cited Wikipedia. We cited Wikipedia and their legal documents. No one would know this, of course, until we make videos about it. So we confronted the head of the New York Times, a man named Dean Baquet. We confronted him, our brave, intrepid reporter, Christian Hartsock, confronted Dean Wikipedia, Baquet. Wikipedia, your lawyer citing Wikipedia. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think it's funny too. So you're laughing at your I lawyers. Think Project your lawyers are citing I think Wikipedia. Project is hilarious. Is that and Dean Baquet laughed like a hyena. So we confronted Dean Baquet again after we won that victory, and this time Dean Baquet was not laughing. How you been? I just wanted to check in and see if you're still laughing. Between us, only one of us has had a New York State Supreme Court judge call us deceptive disinformation. It wasn't us, it was you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he called us a loser. So, oh, there's Christian Hartsock, the guy who did it. Hey, Christian. Oh, there. That's, I don't know where he, where he, I don't know where he came from, but brave, 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 brave young guy. He called us a loser. 
He's the one who's losing the lawsuit, Dean Becky. Project Veritas has never lost a lawsuit. Not once. And we don't lose. We don't lose because we tell the truth. Because we have nothing to hide. Unlike them, they have everything to hide. Every time they get deposed, it's embarrassing to them. Like this woman, this moment, you may wonder, what is this deposition thing that Veritas keeps talking about? This is what I'm talking about. This is what we're going to do with the New York Times and CNN and Twitter. This is an extraordinary moment when you're under oath, on video, you can't lie. And once in a while, you have to tell the truth. Check this out. Have you been to the right barn? Don't you try lie, was. girl. Did you hear the statement, have you been to the right barn? I did. Who said that? That was me. Okay. Um, did you eventually publish a video of these events? Uh, I published a video of events that occurred earlier that evening. Ah, so you, you, you edited out these parts where, these, these first two parts where you and Ryan Clayton were uh, confronting Ms. Moss. You didn't I object to your characterization of my actions. Okay, well you're not a lawyer. So your lawyer's here, and he'll object for you. So what I'm asking you is... Well, I disagree with your characterization of my part? actions. Wh which part? That I edited anything out. Oh, okay. So what did you do that these parts didn't make the video? Well, so it's called editing. That's what happens when you're under oath. Weird things happen. They've never been held accountable in their lives until now. And they project, they, they, they are what they hate, and they project onto me what they are, like in another extraordinary moment. Did those last two statements make the, your published final version of, uh, of this confrontation with Ms. Moss? I don't believe so. Why not? Because it wasn't necessary in the narrative that we were trying to produce wasn't necessary in the narrative. See, that's who these people are at the New York Times and CNN. And do you know who this is? Oh, that's right. This man is an editor for the New York Times. We have deposition tapes into the New York Times and we are going to release them. And they're gonna be held accountable. They've never been held accountable. See, that's him waving his hand, swearing under oath. This is what we're gonna be releasing, Dean Backhey and you'll be held accountable, which you've never been held accountable before. Now, we've been banned from Twitter. Project Veritas has been banned from Twitter, which I view as a badge of honor, by the way. And uh, they've, they've banned us for quoting the CNN guy. I don't know why they didn't ban CNN. Completely banned, but we sued Twitter for defamation. We sued Twitter. And we recently won a huge victory in that case. Oh, Section 230, well, they're not protected by Section 230 because this is what Twitter said about me. They said I created a fake account, which I did not do, so I sued them, and we're gonna depose CEO Jack Dorsey under oath. That's what we're going to do. Now, Jack Dorsey thought that he could shut us down, cut my tongue out, but every, every story that we've done since the Twitter ban has trended on Twitter thanks to all of you. But, you know, that doesn't stop them from lying about us. As you all know, the Retracto Alpaca is very busy. And, uh, you know, the Retracto theme song is great stuff. They keep lying over and over again. And they accuse me of being the liar. So in this one, one of my favorite retractions ever we did since I last was here was this Bloomberg reporter said that I was on an Amtrak train and I was... I, he said I wasn't wearing a mask, as I was violating the mask policy, but what the Bloomberg reporter omitted from his article was that I was drinking a beverage. I can't wear a mask while I'm drinking a cup of coffee. So to demonstrate this, I have a colleague here, uh, <laughs> Michael. Oh, there you go. Hey, Michael, come on out here. So this is the absurdity. This is what they make me do. Bloomberg News had to print a correction uh, Michael's going to demonstrate you all how difficult it is, how implausible, how impossible to drink a beverage 
while one is wearing a mask, take it away. It's not possible. <laughs> there was a, there was, I don't think you got a drop in your system. Not one. This is what they make us do. So, <laughs> the answer to the question, what can I do, is an important one. What people really want to know is how they can make a difference. How they can have meaning in their lives. How they can solve the problems in our country. And it comes down to, what are you willing to do? What access do you have? Are you on the inside of an institution like government, universities? All of you could do what the people you're about to meet have done, and I'm going to introduce you to them now, before we get to the new whistleblower, perhaps the biggest whistleblower in Project Veritas history. But first, Corey Porch, CNN insider, was a catalyst for undercover people and people within CNN coming out and reporting what these people were saying. None of this is going to surprise you, but it does confirm suspicions. CNN, a political operation designed to elect federal candidates to office, and they don't want you to know that. Don't take my word for it. Let me just quote the guy in the control room. I think, I, I think we got him through this term. We would always show shots of him jogging. Him and aviator shades, and like, a, like you paint him as a young geriatric. We were creating a story there that we didn't know anything about. You know, we were... That's, that's, I think that's probably it. Look what we did. We got Trump back. I am 100% going to say it. And I 100% believe it, that if it wasn't for saying that, I don't know that Trump would have got voted out. Our focus was to get Trump out of office, right? Without saying it, that's what it was, right? So our next thing is going to be for climate change awareness. Do you think it's going to be just like a lot of like fear? Like climate? Yeah, fear sells. Fear sells. No one ever says those things out loud, but it's obvious. No one ever says that out loud. But we got Trump out. Also, COVID, he says COVID is gangbusters for the ratings. COVID, gangbusters of ratings. COVID, gangbusters of ratings. Rating. Gangbusters for the ratings. He also says the death count needs to be higher. We need more people to die so we can sell more ads at CNN. Which is why we can't say the death toll on the side. Let's make it higher. Like, why isn't it high enough, you know, today? Like, it would make our point better if it was higher. We just make it higher. We need a higher, higher death. This is the most trusted name in news. This is what they, this is what Jack Dorsey and Google and Mark Zuckerberg prefer in their algorithms. I would never do this. You would never do this. They do it every day and they maintain a cone of silence because they can't say what they actually think unless they think nobody's watching. And that's why we do undercover work at Project Veritas because to them, it's about fear, it's about lying, it's about money, it's about greed. Like fear really drives numbers. Fear is the thing that keeps you tuned in. If it bleeds, it leads. Yeah. If it bleeds, it leads? Yeah. No, no one ever says it, those things out loud, but it's obvious. Well, now they say it out loud. And by the way, we also confronted Brian Stelter, which is great. See, we got to get, see, we got to get, people say, what, we got to get into the streets with microphones and confront these people and hold them accountable. Do you report any news that Jeff Zucker doesn't directly tell you to report? Brian Stelter was not happy to see us. Also, CNN Insider gave me access to the telephone calls, which we recorded for two months. And then I, I basically informed President Jeff Sucker that I had recorded his phone calls for two months. And uh, this was this extraordinary moment, which is probably one of my favorite moments at Project Veritas. You're unmuted. Hey, Jeff Sucker, are you there? Hey, yeah. this is James O'Keefe. Uh, we've been listening to your CNN calls for basically two months, uh, recording everything. Um, just wanted to ask you some questions, if you have a minute. Um, do you still feel you're the most trusted name in news? Because I have to say, from what I've been hearing on these phone calls, I don't know about that. I mean, we got a lot of recordings that indicate you're not really that uh, independent of a, of a journalist. Okay. Um, thank you for uh, thank you for thank uh, you for your that, comments, James. Um, so, everybody, in light of that, I think what we'll do is we'll we'll set up a, a, a new system. Set up a new system. Maybe, maybe don't lie, because we're just going to get on your new system. We have people inside CNN still recording what's going on, Jeff Sucker.
These people, these people just don't learn. We will find you, we will film you, and we will make you an unwilling internet celebrity, Jeff Zucker. So, by the way, we're suing CNN for defamation after the Twitter lawsuit. So, I look forward to uh, deposing Brian Stelter, deposing Anna Cabrera. De I just love depositions. I, lo I love being deposed because I really don't have anything to hide. And they have everything to hide. So we need to sue them. I asked Carrie, why would you do this? Why did you wear a hidden camera and give up your career for the public's right to know? I decided to wear the camera because I didn't see any other option. Because I, I noticed that I was in a very unique position in space and time to just do something to protect the Republic. And Carrie Porch is here. Come on, Carrie. <laughs> How's it going, Tampa? Student Action Summit. Come on! All right, all right, all right, thank you. We are on limited time, but time, truth transcends time, does it not? Two years ago, my journey started exactly where you were at in a very similar conference. And then I found the time and the courage and the conviction to come find this man. Keep in mind, one decision, one conversation can not only change the direction of your life, but of our republic. So what we're doing, we're looking for the next one, two, 10, 25, or 100 people in this audience, wherever you work and you see the inequity and uh, corruption and malfeasance, we're looking for you to come find me or any of the other heroes you're gonna be introduced to today. Come find us, we'll tell your story and protect you on the back end. Carrie <laughs> Porch, Carrie Porch was the beginning. He was the genesis of so many things to happen next. Recently, Facebook Insider, Morgan Common, inside of Facebook, engineer, he released documents showing things inside Facebook, vaccine hesitancy, you're not allowed to talk about the vaccines, but Zuckerberg can talk about them. He was fired, but we raised Morgan half a million dollars in one day. And that, in turn, inspired more whistleblowers to come public. This is Zach Voorhees inside Google leaking us documents showing Google engaged in algorithmic unfairness. That means to say, even if it's factually true, Google will omit it from the search query because it might be unfair. Seems like something out of George Orwell. Well, that's because it is. He released presentations showing they're programming people. I asked Zach, why would you wear a camera and give up your livelihood at Google and he said this. I feel that when I'm coming and, and explaining what Google was doing, this is an act of atonement, okay, to make my conscience clear. And Zach, are you backstage? Come on out. <laughs> this man, this man. Don't be evil. Organize the world's information and make it universally accessible. That's what Google believed in until the wrong president was democratically elected. And then they threw all that away in order to censor you by merging AI and critical theory. And they would have gotten away with it if it were not for James O'Keefe and the brave employees of Project Veritas. You as students are going to see some very evil things. Record it, and Project Veritas has your back. Thank you. Zach, at Google, these are some of the bravest people I've ever met, and they they wouldn't ask you to do anything they didn't do themselves. Zach led to this guy, postal worker, Pennsylvania. Richard Hopkins overheard his supervisor backdate a ballot and went on the record while employed. And I heard him say to the supervisor that they messed up yesterday. That they, and I was, so I was like, oh, what did they mess up on? And uh, he told the, the supervisor that, um, 
they had uh, postmarked one of the pallet for the fourth instead of the third. They then fired him from the Postal Service and sent federal agents from New York, Office of the Inspector General, to interrogate him, to coerce him, to change his story. This guy was recorded by his phone. Richard had his phone recorded the whole interrogation. You can't, this seems like something out of science fiction. Listen to this. I, I, I'm not, well I am. I am trying to twist you a little bit because in that, believe it or not, your mind will kick in. I'm not scaring you, but I am scaring you. They don't want to expose corruption. They want to cover up the fraud and corruption and coerce a witness. Listen to it again. And listen to him talk about how he felt as he was being coerced. They, they were grilling the hell out of me. How are you feeling right now? I'm kind of pissed. I feel like I just got played. The Washington Post came out with an article. Said he had recanted his statement because he was coerced. And the Washington Post relied upon anonymous sources. When he actually had a recording of what happened inside that interrogation, this man is a combat Marine veteran and described his experiences as... He described what he went through as being worse than what he endured overseas. I was in Afghanistan and Iraq. Two tours in, in the, while I was in the Marines. I was a Marine in five, for five years. And uh, I'll tell y'all, I'd rather be out back in Afghanistan getting shot at by Afghans, honest to God, than, you know, having to be in this kind of position. Richard Hopkins is here. Come on out. How y'all doing today? So, every cop, military member, postal worker, government official, they all take a similar oath. That oath begins with, I, Richard Hopkins, do solemnly swear to protect the Constitution from, the, Constitution from all enemies, foreign and domestic. Now, that is the first part of all these oaths. Why is that? Because it's a very important part. We're protecting our country from all our enemies even the enemies within our own nation. You are capable of that. You don't need to take that oath to be able to follow the same oath that I do. And be a hero. Do what you can. Have a good day. Richard Hopkins. Imagine, imagine a hundred people like that. Well, you don't have to imagine it because it's going to happen. After he did what he did, we had news broadcasters come to us. We had, we had journalists, journalists working for television news. Ivory Hecker paved the way after going on the air and announcing the bias and what she viewed as the corruption at her local TV affiliate in Houston, Texas. Fox 26 reporter Ivory Hecker is live in Montgomery County to take a look at that aspect. Thanks, guys. That's right. Before we get to that story, I want to let you, the viewers, know that Fox Corp has been muzzling me to keep certain information from you, the viewers. And from what I'm gathering, I am not the only reporter being too subjected to this. I am going to be releasing some recordings about what goes on behind the scenes at Fox because it applies to you, the viewers. I found a nonprofit journalism group called Project Veritas. It's going to help put that out tomorrow, so tune into them. But as for this heat wave across Texas, you can see what it's doing to AC units. Ivory couldn't make it, but she recorded a video here talking about what is journalism? What is going on in the media? And by the way, as a result of what Ivory did, we've had dozens of people like her across the country reaching out to us. The primary purpose of journalism is to provide people with the information they need to be free and self-governing. That is a quote from my journalism school textbook a decade ago, the same textbook that warned of the threat of powerful news corporations and the monopoly that they can have on information. Since I came out with my true story as a journalist working for a powerful news corporation, I have heard from dozens of other journalists across the nation dealing with the same thing, their corporation censoring out facts that don't fit the corporate interests. By shining light on this issue, I hope that we can return to the essence of journalism, which is an allegiance first to the citizens and the truth. 
and by doing so, may we empower people with the information they need to stay free and self-governing. Ivory Hacker. You're the journalists. Every one of you has the power to do this. You're the journalists. Now you're the journalists. You have the independent ability to go out and get the information, which led to this whistleblower. April Moss, journalist, meteorologist, CBS News Michigan, was reporting on a storm crossing the Great Lakes region. Little did CBS News know that April Moss was the storm. Showers moving in around 8 a.m. And speaking of a brand new week, I will be sitting down this week with Project Veritas to discuss the discrimination that CBS is enforcing upon its employees. Tune in to Project Veritas for my full story. Now, later Monday, we will see those showers continuing through late morning. Yes! Yeah! <laughs> the moment... You stop caring about what the media thinks about you is the moment that you're truly free to actually make a difference. <laughs> April Ma this is probably one of the most powerful things I've ever heard, and I know I'm going over, hopefully they'll let me do it because I'm about to bring on the next whistleblower. Before I do, please listen to April tell you why she chose to do this. It's not, it's not about me. They have no idea what it's like to, to be burdened with this and feeling like I'm watching my country disintegrate and if I don't stand up and do something when I'm able to you know I just don't know that I could live with myself we are supposed to be the people that bring light to corruption so basically they're going to use the power of all of Viacom CBS brand brands I, is this I, journalism I, I don't think that this is journalism at all I think that I think that this is propaganda being pushed on people why would you do that you know basically that's the most selfish thing I've ever seen. The only change is going to be, you know, on our weekend weather person. That's the only change. It's hard to hear that. You're a wife and a, a mother of four. How do they feel about this? They are so supportive. I'm so blessed to have them. They, they support me. We put our faith and hope and trust in God. That's what we do. And April Moss's family had her back. We were able to raise her some money. April Moss, come on stage. Hello, freedom lovers. Well, listen, I took a stand for medical freedom, but you are the future of where this can go. So I implore you today, come find me, come see me. I'm going to be at the Project Veritas booth. I want to meet you, and I want to get you set up so that you can go into your universities, your schools, your places of business, and you can be an insider as well. So I, along with the other brave heroes, have paved the path as well as James, to give you guys the opportunity to partner with us. We want you. God bless you and thank you so much. God bless. So much courage. Courage is the virtue that sustains all other virtues. And now, finally, the moment you've all been waiting for. We've never done this before, so we're gonna go ahead and do it. This next whistleblower is probably I think it's the biggest one we've ever done. He's currently employed right now. And uh, he, this story is going to go out the moment I bring him on stage on the internet. His name is David, like David versus Goliath. And these people here are our heroes. They are the answer to the question, what can I do? The police officers, the nurses, the engineers. This man is an engineer. He went to the Rochester Institute of Technology. He's 25 years old. He's a packaging engineer for Hasbro Toy Company, and he's blowing the whistle on critical race theory against children inside of Hasbro Toys. I'd like to introduce you to David Johnson. My name is uh, <clears throat> David Johnson. I'm a packaging engineer for Hasbro. They are attempting to covertly push CRT, critical race theory, through branding and messaging through their products. I decided to come to Project Veritas because I oppose the indoctrination of children that they wanted to push. 
Explain what we're looking at here. This is the program developed by the Conscious Kid, which is working with Hasbro to teach children about racial bias at an early age. Is this a, a, a mandatory all hands training? Yes, it was mandatory for me. Children as young as two are already using race to reason about people's behaviors. Two-year-old racists is just an absurd concept. By age three, children are already starting to apply stereotypes. They also may use racist language intentionally at this age. I think this is where the, the mask starts to slip a little bit. Is this what people are talking about regarding critical race theory? This is critical race theory in practice. They explain that the white children in particular have the particular bias against black people. It's a mainstream ideology now, um, and it's in a lot of our institutions. People that I've spoken to about these issues, and I'm trying to explain to them why teaching people to segregate based on race or by gender or by any other inherent characteristic is wrong. If you want your children to be looking at people based on their race, then you are opposing Dr. Martin Luther King's dream. So I think that's progress in its truest sense, that we should not be judging each other by the color of our skin, but rather by the content of our character and actions. If the next generation of children is allowed to be indoctrinated to believing that racial segregation is a good thing, I don't think it will lead our country to anywhere good. This isn't something I wanted to do. This is something I felt I had to do. This is a hill worth dying on. If I can make one person just step away from this ideology and say, you know what, maybe that's not the way, it's not the path towards a better future, then I think it's worth it. David Johnson, we reached out for Hasbro for comment and we got a response yesterday. We got a response with another person within Hasbro that would like to do what David is doing. David, David, literally, David versus Goliath. Goliath is now, the oppressor is now the oppressed. Goliath is attacked on all sides, while David assumes new strength. The hunter becomes the hunted. David, come on stage. <laughs> How you doing? Wow, there's a lot of you. Um, didn't think I'd ever be doing this, but um, I think it's important to speak out against critical race theory in our country. This is not the future that Martin Luther King dreamed of, and it's not something that only I could have done. Speaking out is tough, but it's something that each and every one of you is capable of. Come speak to us, speak to Veritas. We will help you. We will help get your message out. And if you find your voice and ground your principles, you can be a hero too. Thank you. Come seek him out. Click the tweet, click the whole story. You can click on the video. Story is out. I'm banned on Twitter, so you guys are gonna have to get the story out. And if you see waste or fraud or abuse or corruption, you know who to call. Uh, Veritas tips at protonmail.com. I ain't afraid of no ghosts. See you all tonight. I ain't Nine o'clock. No Veritas party. Hey, everybody, we are at a critical time in our country and Turning Point USA. We are at the front lines of what's happening in the American culture war. We are on pace to have 1000 high school chapters by the end of this year. We have events with thousands and thousands of students, including right now, 
in the very room that this event, the Student Action Summit, is happening. We had our Young Women's Leadership Summit with 2,500 young conservative women leaders from across the country. We have a school board watch list project coming out in August. We have our professor watch list project. We have our China on Campus project. We are doing the most ambitious campus tour in the entire country. I personally go and visit these college campuses, but we need your help. And every single gift you give right now is matched dollar for dollar. That's right, dollar for dollar. All you have to do is go to tpusa.com. That's tpusa.com. Hit the Donate tab. It's hard to miss. And give what you can. Every dollar is matched dollar for dollar. And we here at Turning Point USA, we have 165 full-time people on our staff in the field that are doing the work of organizing groups, of getting students trained and activated to be able to take back our country. If you're worried about our educational system, if you're worried about the future of America, then please back us up if you can. Give us the tools and the resources we need to keep growing. We are going to be hiring another 28 people just in August in just one project in particular and 30 other people just to work on college campus type work. And you guys can help us at TP usa.com that's tpusa.com god bless you guys thank you so much for backing us remember your gift is matched dollar for dollar at tpusa.com